So indeed, so the subject of my lecture series is not contact homology, and so this is some subject um, that we studied for a uh, number of years. And uh, in some sense, it can be viewed as applications of, of uh, this symplectic field theory package to uh, knot theory, or more generally, uh, to uh, you know differential topology. So um, <clears throat> the the series will have three parts. So today I'm going to give some kind of introduction, defining uh, not contact homology in particular, but starting by talking about the short Legendrian contact homology, which is part of this uh, symplectic field theory uh, package, and then try to get to the point where you can actually get the feeling for how you would compute these things uh, more concretely, not just uh, showing that the theory exists, but actually compute it. And then uh, <coughs> uh, tomorrow, no, maybe not tomorrow, but the second lecture, uh, I will talk about, probably continue with that, and then talk about uh, relation to string topology. And finally, in the third lecture, I'm going to talk about relations to more physical theories, so like Chern-Simons and, and, and uh, topological string uh, theory. Um, there was kind of more recent developments of the subject over the last few years. So, but anyway, so let, let me start by uh, giving an in kind of some introductory remarks about the relation between differential topology and, and symplectic, symplectic geometry or contact geometry. So there is a, somehow this basic... Uh, basic thing that if, if you have a smooth manifold M, then it has a, a cotangent bundle, which is a, a symplectic manifold, in fact, a <coughs> Weinstein manifold, so exact symplectic manifold. And one may now ask the question, how much of the smooth topology, or just the topology first of M, does the symplectic geometry of this T star M remember? So, uh, and and the, f the first, uh, so I, I'm not going to explain these results, I'm just going to state them so they see where, where, what we are going to do fit in. So, so if you have uh, <coughs> a symplectomorphism between T star M uh, and some other T star or some other manifold N, then uh, if, you look, if you look at the zero section in here, M, that sits in there as a Lagrangian submanifold, and the image of that would be an exact Lagrangian submanifold in T star n. And there's a theorem uh, which has some history, but somehow the, this full version is due, due to a Boseid and Krog. And it says that if, if uh, L is an exact Lagrangian submanifold in T star m, then uh, there is a simple homotopy equivalence between L and the zero section. Um, so, so in fact, uh, the, the homotopy type of, of the zero section is remembered by the symplectic topology. And this proof goes via Fleur homology with, with local coefficients. Somehow, there is a, some uh, history to this theorem that I want to tell you about. But there certainly were lots of uh, contributions uh, compact, yes. So sorry, L, 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 M, <coughs> M and L are closed, closed manifolds. So that's right. So uh, compact, no boundary. So, so the next question is: Does this sort of go beyond? Would, would the symplectic geometry feel anything more than the homotopy type? And the answer again is yes. So uh, the, maybe the easiest starting point for such theorem is to start when, when M, in fact, sort of has no homotopy theory. So that would mean that M is a homotopy sphere. And then there is a theorem that builds on <coughs> the first theorem in this kind of uh, spirit was due to, is, is due to Abu Said again. But this theorem is in a paper by myself and Krog and Smith. And Smith. And it says the following, that um, uh, 
that if, if sigma and sigma prime are all dimensional homotopy spheres, Uh, and, and if the cotangent bundle of sigma is symplectomorphic to the cotangent bundle of sigma prime, uh, then uh -huh. yeah. then uh, sigma uh, is uh, I don't know the class of sigma in the in the in the class of homotopy spheres there are equal uh, modulo boundary parallelizable uh, sphere. So in, in this dimension, the uh, 2k minus 1 perhaps. All dimensions are 2k. So um, in, when you look at this is some kind of classical differential topology, which I won't talk much about, but, but if you have a Homotopy spheres, they found that they, they formed this age coborism group, and inside there, there's a subgroup, the bound, boundary parallelizable manifolds, and, and we know that they are, uh, that, that their cotangent bundle can, can be equal, symplectic manifold, only if they're equal modulo this boundary parallelizable one. So, so the. Huh? Thank you. Um, which corresponds to changing the orientation of sigma. So this is sort of not so serious. Okay, anyway, so, um, so this theorem tells you that in fact the symplectic geometry of the cotangent bundle is pretty sensitive. And I would say that the proof that I'm not going to talk about but goes beyond, uh, you know, Fleur theory and SFT and the like, it's kind of different v version where you use a moduli space of holomorphic curves not just as to, to get some fundamental cycle or something like that, but it's actually it's a K-theory class of it or, or you know, something like that. So, so basic, basically you're, you're using the moduli space more than you're using things derived from it. So it, it's somehow a very interesting uh, way of using moduli spaces, but here it's a little bit ad hoc used. So it's, it's very hard to use it directly, and so I encourage everybody to think hard about this um, and see if you can find maybe the expectation for what is the how could it so, be sharpened? Yeah, so the the sharpest expectation, or the, this is this uh, nearby Lagrangian conjecture, that will say that any exact Lagrangian sitting inside here actually is Hamiltonian isotopic to zero section. You still believe in this? Should you believe in this? I'm not so sure, but then uh, somehow you should ask Thomas Krog. So he's uh, kind of the. He's the leading disbeliever, I think. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. So, for example, uh, yeah, I, I will I will mention something in in, in one second in this direction. So um, now, what, what we are going to talk about is not this, but we're going to talk about a relative version of that. So, if you have a submanifold. Uh, k inside the manifold, so again, closed, everything is closed, then we can associate the symplectic geometric object also to that. So, and the natural thing is to take the Lagrangian co-normal uh, inside the cotangent bundle of M. And what we are going to do is related to that, but we're also going to look at the Lagrangian co-normal. So I'll define this in, in one second. Inside the unit cotangent bundle of M viewed as a contact Manifold. So uh, the Lagrangian co-normal is uh, the set of, of points in the cotangent bundle. So Q is along the, its coordinate along the base, and P is the corresponding fiber coordinate. So that Q is in in the submanifold, and P, when you restrict it to the tangent space at this Q is equal zero. So it's somehow exactly the normal, normal vectors uh, of k, but thought of as in lying in the fiber direction. So these are obviously Lagrangians of manifold. And, uh, <coughs> and the Lagrangian thing is this just Lk intersected with, say, the unit cotangent bundle 
you fix the Riemannian metric. Uh, and that's a Legendrian submanifold. And, and what we are going to do is actually we're going to specialize quite, quite a bit more. So we are going to, for, so for this lecture series, we take k to be a naught uh, in m, which is equal to r3 most of the time, and sometimes perhaps s3. It doesn't make much difference. So, so we, we will study a very special, a special case of this. But before we go to this special case and then and I define the holomorphic curve theories, et cetera, that we are going to use, it's worth mentioning um, some results uh, about this stuff and see how, how well it works with respect to things like this, this theorem. And uh, there, so one should say, and that's maybe kind of a good reason for talking about this, that the, the, this theory, so when you apply the holomorphic, the SFT package or some part of it, to this lambda k, then it's quite successful. So for example, as we will see, the theory detects the unknot. So the, the, it will be, I'll explain this. So there will be a DJ associated to any knot, and this DJ looks like that of the unknot exactly only when it is the unknot and for no other knots. And it is a pretty, pretty nice uh, knot invariant that knows about things like a polynomial of the knot, and et cetera, et cetera. So, but, but, but let's first consider somehow this counterpart to this in high dimensions, where um, there was uh, some observations uh, recently made by uh, Dimitri Rissell and then another student of mine, uh, Eriksson Östman, and, and uh, it's the following. So if you start in, in R6, then in R6 you can embed Three sphere, so there is the standard three sphere, and the knot theory here, in fact, is pretty simple. So, if you if you appeal topologist uh, or C zero topologist, or maybe no Lipschitz topologist, maybe or so kind of if you Lipschitz topologist, then there is only kind of one uh, knot class, but there is uh, an integer worth of smooth knots, and uh, the <coughs> the invariant can be seen as follows. So you take this, this embedding of the S3 in R6 and then you'd find the four dimensional cipher surface embedded and you take its uh, signature. So the signature is some kind of multiple by of 16 and then you can realize all these knots. So there are these knots, three, three knots in five space, which are actually differentially noted but PL standard. So one might ask, would this lambda k, so, so, so k, so this is k, c thing. So what about this lambda k, which is now the co-normal of, of S3? And topologically, so it's an S, it's the boundary of, like the boundary of tubular neighbors, it's S2 times S3. Um, does, does this lambda k remember uh, smooth naughtiness? Is that six or five? This is six. So the, the boundaries would be in S2, right? So lambda k is, is diffeomorphic to S3, S3 times S2, right? So it's a trivial normal bundle. No? Yeah. And the answer is no. Um, because, um, in fact, it does not. Uh, and, and why is that? So uh, the observation is that actually, so you see, uh, so let me draw the knot and then take this tubular neighborhood, boundary of tubular neighborhood. Now, the co-normal lift can also be somehow, it's clearly isotopic to the co-normal lift with the outward normal of this boundary of a tubular neighborhood, right? It doesn't matter if you, if, if you lift right on the knot, or you fatten it up and lift a little bit along other vectors. And in fact, the, 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 tube, the boundary of a tubular neighborhood of the knot, k, and of the standard one, even though the knots are not isotopic, the boundaries of tubular neighborhoods are isotopic. So this is some kind of just a consequence of H. Kobordsen theorem, or Smale's handle cancellation. So, so here you can you can define a function, uh, Morse function on S, if you put S6 instead of R6, so, 
So you have a, a minimum here and an index three handle here. And so the, the complement of that, if you, you can cancel all the critical points, so that means that the complement looks like an S2 times a D4. So somehow the, the complement retracts into an S2 sitting here, and, and the S2 is completely free in R6, right? Because it's two plus two is too little. So, so that means that you can isotope this tubular neighborhood to that tubular neighborhood, and therefore you can isotope lambda k to lambda s3. On the other hand, and this, this is somehow interesting open question, so the secret to this is that this, this weird note, the Heffliger note, it actually lives here somehow in a tubular, on the boundary of a tubular neighborhood. And one could, for, for example, ask the question that if you pick one of these Lachandrian isotopes, anyone, would it have to take, could it take a section of this kind of normal bundle into a section of the other one? And probably, I would guess the answer is no. So, so that it still knows about this, but, but it doesn't, it's somehow it's some parameterization question, right? And does the Lachandrian isotope have to really mess up the parameterization? Okay. Uh, so, if, yeah. if that's not true, does it break this nearby uh, Legendrian conjecture? No, no. It doesn't break really anything. But for the nearby Lagrangian conjecture, I think great question is if, so now this is in R6, and, and, and if you think about this T star S3, that's also a six dimensional thing. And you have more or less the counterparts of this. You have the zero section, you have a kind of Heffliger counterpart of zero section and so on. And I think it's unknown if, if they are represented by Lagrangian embeddings. So I think this is a reasonable question. Can you find Lagrangian S3 in the isotopic class of the Heffliger sphere in T star S3? So that, and that would certainly break the conjecture, but maybe it's not that easy, so I don't know. Uh, well. Uh, Okay, so th this was the uh, end, end of the introduction almost, uh, but one could maybe say here that one of the things that little bit go wrong here is that the co-dimension co is too big. So when you're in co-dimension two, then certainly this non cotank tomology, exactly as in the case of knots in R3, will be pretty powerful because it feels a lot of properties of the fundamental group of the, of the complement. So okay. Um, but that's uh, enough of, of uh, of introduction to the general area. So we, we will now study this not contact homology. Think of the fact that Lambda K doesn't remember smooth knottiness as a shadow of a, as a shadow of the fact that there's no PL knottiness. Yeah, I mean it is. So here it is. But uh, so what I suspect is that uh, is that Lambda K, not as a submanifold, but as a parameterized submanifold, as a parameterized Lachandrian submanifold, does remember smooth knottiness. That would be my guess. And that, that's, of course, I don't know how to prove, otherwise I'd give some other talk, but, okay, so. <laughs> you were saying that the smooth modding is distinguished by the signature of the cipher surfaces. Uh -huh. So if you take those cipher surfaces and put those in the, in the cotangent bundle, then what? Yeah, so, so, they, so here you wouldn't quite have a cipher surface, but you would have a, a surface going, so if you have, a, so here's your S3, and then you have your, Strange knot. So, so there you would have a four manifold interpolating between the two, and you could take the signature of that. So that would be the that would be the counterpart of this Heffliger signature, I think. Uh, but but this is just you're just assuming now the knots are smooth, and then you're asking, can you actually find a Lagrangian representative so that this cobordism has non-trivial signature, and that's. Uh, if you can, you're famous. <laughs> I think. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay, so, so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to describe for you uh, Legendrian contact homology in a, in a setting which is sufficient for, for what we are going to do later, but not completely in this uh, uh, unit called tangent bundle of R3, but I will start out a little bit more generally. So, so why is a contact, contact 2n minus 1 manifold? And, and the contact form alpha is the contact one form. And inside this Y, we have a, a Legendrian submanifold. <coughs> and, uh, and, and what is this Legendrian DGA? So, so we'll define. Uh, Legendrian DJ uh, can, is part of SFT. Uh, so if you want to just, before I go into details, what is it? Well, it is the attempt, it is the answer to the following question. You try to do some kind of Fleur homology on the path space, so gamma, uh, So here is lambda, and here is lambda, and this is a path gamma taking lambda to itself. And you try to do the Fleur homology for the action functional, which sends such path gamma to the action. And then uh, you, <coughs> sorry, you cannot quite do it, and, and somehow the, these SFT type splittings that you see forces you to use some other algebraic structure than, than just a, a chain complex. And that's, that's what I'm going to, to uh, explain. So, for, so since this is a lot of kind of uh, technical business going on, so, so, so let me be precise. So, so we, will, we will restrict to, so we assume that there are no, no closed orbits. And in, uh, in, in Y, uh, which is, which is the case, right, for the unit cotangent bundle of R3. Uh, maybe not for unit cotangent bundle of S3, but, but anyway. And we will also assume uh, that the first churn class of the, of the uh, contact plane field <coughs> uh, is zero. And I think that I will assume that this Y is simply connected. And uh, what else? I'll probably assume that the mass. Huh? So I was about to ask whether no, con no contractible closed orbit would be enough. But since it would be. I, it would be. It would be. But I, I, I want to somehow to get the things over. Maybe, I, <coughs> maybe it's zero. Okay. <laughs> what you prefer? Okay. So and then um, and and I will also. So that I, I'll talk about this mass law class. But I'll take the mass law class of lambda to be zero, to have the theory graded. Are these assumptions really necessary or to just to make it easier to explain? It's, it's, it's just to make it easier to explain. So they are not necessary and uh, s some of them are slightly serious. So uh, these, these two things affect the grading. So you'd have to do some, some, something about the grading. <coughs> uh, right, so this, this is somehow is the serious, uh, the serious assumption. And what would happen is I, I will now define for you an algebra which just generated by chords, and it will be an algebra over some coefficient ring. But if there are orbits, then the Legendrian algebra would be an algebra over the contact homology orbit algebra that, I, that I'm not going to talk about. And that orbit algebra certainly does require a lot more of machinery of the nature that's being discussed here about polyphones or something like that, so abstract perturbations. Whereas this, what we are doing here, we can actually get away without uh, we get away with the classic, I mean, with classical perturbation theory. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, um, right. I'm probably forgetting half the, some more assumption, but it doesn't matter. So, so, uh, so what is this thing? So, what, what we are going to do is we, we, first we have the, the rave, rave vector field. We probably. You already discussed this, right? So this is somehow 
in the kernel of <coughs> the alpha and normalizing so that it's equal to 1. And so the generators of our algebra will be rave chords. So they will be <coughs> chords with endpoints on lambda. And the algebra itself, so A of lambda uh, will be uh, the following. So it will be an algebra over the group ring of the second um, homology of y relative lambda uh, and generated by rave chords. And well, I should say, it's a un so this is a unital algebra generated by rave chords. And this, no, this algebra is not commutative in any way. So kind of rave chord A times rave chord B is not rave chord B times rave chord A. So it's just like that. And <coughs> this is, uh, it's a... Uh, the H2Y lambda classes, they commute with the rave chords? Uh, yeah, so, so right now, so for, for the first verse, I wanted to say this is a kind of simple version. So I will first take them to commute. It's not really necessary. So you can soup this up, and we will do that tomorrow. But for now, I will take the coefficients just to commute with all the rave cores. But it's not really necessary. So this could be like some kind of module where you can put these things in between, and they don't necessarily commute. And we'll see geometric reason why, why you can do such things in a little while. OK. So this is the this is the so we are defining a DGA and we just define the A kind of so now the G so the grading so grading uh, so here here is a chord C and so what we do we pick a path inside the Lagrangian uh, so this is some path inside lambda. And now, since y was simply connected, we could somehow extend. We can fill it in with, with a disk. right? And now, on the boundary of this disk, we have the tangent spaces of lambda giving a field of Lagrangian planes in the contact plane field. And when you have that, uh, that path, you somehow you can take the tangent space of lambda at the end point and transport it to the starting point with the linearized rave flow and you get a, a, almost a closed path. You have to close it up somehow uh, by positive rotation and you take the Maslow index of that of, or, or the Conley Sender index. So let, let me, I'll explain in examples how you compute this later. So, so anyway, the, uh, yeah, the grading of, of C is equal to uh, the Conley Sander index of this C, which is this Maslow index I was talking about, minus one. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at this. It's just you have to think about this is somehow related to the homotopy class of, of these Lagrangian plane fields, and this is what normally enters into grading um, when you compute these indices. So, okay. Uh, so, so. So we have an idea about the grading, at least. And now, uh, what is the differential? This is, of course, the most important piece of the algebra. So, so first, we fix, fix an, uh, uh, so, so, so first, we consider, as was done before here, we consider the symplectization r times y. Uh, and here we take the symplectic form dE to the t alpha. I guess everybody saw this before. And we fix, fix an almost complex structure, uh, j, which is translation, translation invariant, uh, and takes the contact plane field to itself and, and somehow this j of, of the extra t direction is equal to the ray direction. So this, this probably everybody, you probably talked about this, right? Yeah, or no? Uh, 
Oh yeah, Chris, so, I did. So, <laughs> this was multiple cover, that's good. So, yeah, I don't know if you should divide by <laughs> one factorial or just divide by how many times it was mentioned. But anyway, so it's, okay. Um, okay, so, 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 so you, you can re recognize this thing. And then, uh, oops, sorry. And then, uh, we have this notion, again, probably multiple covered, of finite energy. So we have the energy, or omega energy, so it's an area in the contact planes. And then we have sort of this cutoff area in the kind of, here we go, alpha energy, but maybe lambda energy in some other talk. So, so going in this, this other direction where we have to take a cutoff function. And then, uh, as probably was discussed, at least in the case of orbits, we, we know that the finite, so so uh, finite energy curves, so I'm just stating this a little bit imprecise. So finite energy curves, uh, uh, holomorphic disks is enough, uh, are asymptotic to ray cord strips at punctures. So, so indeed, note that by, by this requirement, if you take the just rabe chord C times R, then this is a holomorphic strip. With, with these are the trivial strips, which counterparts are trivial cylinders from Helmut's talk. And now, if you have any such finite energy disk, let's say, mapping in there, then it has a number of positive punctures, a number of negative punctures, where it's asym strongly, exponentially asymptotic to this uh, Disk provided that all the rave cores are, are non-degenerate. Okay, <clears throat> and the moduli spaces that we will use, they are moduli spaces of a specific kind of disks with one positive and several negative punctures. <clears throat> for a rape cord, cord A, and the word of rape cords B underline, which is B1 up to BM, uh, the, we, we consider the moduli space M sub A, which is, this is, I'll explain what A is in a minute, A B <coughs> is the moduli space of holomorphic disks uh, on the following form. So this disk has one positive puncture at A. And it has several negative punctures, which appear when you go around the disk as B1, B2, B3, and then finally BM, right? So that, that's, that's, that's determining this word. And finally, uh, remember that we have these capping disks. So we can somehow take a little disk here, a little disk here, here. They, they're just, we just choose them, it's up there. We, for each chord, we choose such a disk. So when we fill it in by these capping disks, then this uh, creature, the holomorphic disks and the capping disks, they define a homology class inside H2, right? Relative. So that's, a, that's what this, this guy is. So, <clears throat> so this is the moduli space we'll use. And the dimension, uh, the formal dimension of this M, a, in our case, is simply equal to the grading of A minus the grading of B, which is the sum of the gradings of the factors in B. Okay, so, so the differential that we are going to define is simply defined by counting such things in one-dimensional moduli spaces, so the kind of minimal dimension. Something interesting happens, so because, as you've heard about this or invariant, somehow the mi minimal, 
dimension of an interesting disk is uh, one. And so the differential from this algebra to itself, maybe I have lambda, uh, uh, satisfies Leibniz rule. Uh, and is linear on coefficients, so coefficients just go through. Um, and on generators, it's defined as d of a is the sum over uh, a minus b equals 1. And then number of r families in this moduli space times the word b. And maybe I put here e to the a, so indicating we're in the group ring. OK. And then, uh, so, so this is the definition of the, of the differential. And then we have the expected theorems. So, uh, so d squared is equal to 0. Uh, and and uh, uh, AD. Let me not say too much about this. Is is invariant up to homotopy uh, under deformations? Uh, let's say under Lagrangian isotopy of lambda. So, so in the case uh, that we need it, so in the case when the ambient space is a one-jet manifold, uh, <coughs> one-jet space, as, as we will see the, the unit cotangent bundle of R3 is, um, this uh, theorem was actually sort of fully proved in work of myself and Etnair and Sullivan. Um, so, so, and, and that you can do without using abstract perturbations for for some reasons, that maybe I'll see if I get to explain it. Otherwise, if you can explain maybe during discussion. So, so what it says is that if you, if you pick this J generic, then D squared equals 0. And, uh, and also, when you deform the thing, you get uh, homotopy. Um, one, one would need to say what is this homotopy. But in particular, in particular, the homology of the thing is invariant on this. OK. Sorry, Tobias, uh, A is the energy? No, A, A, sorry, A is the, this A is the, it's, it's the algebra. No, uh, in the formula for the differential, we have yeah. E to the A. Uh, e to the A, e, A, A here, yeah, right. This is just stupid notation for, so A is in, in H2, Y lambda, and then I write somehow E to the A for the same thing in, in the group ring. So, so th this is some integer number, and then times this thing, so it lives in the grouping. So it's just, you can think, if you want, you can think about it, it's just A. This is, OK. Right. OK, so let's consider uh, the simplest example of this theory that, that was also the first, somehow, uh, that was discovered. It's called the chekhanov iliashberg algebra of a knot, the only knot in R3. So, So consider the ambient manifold to be R3 with the standard contact structure dc minus y dx. So here, uh, a Lagrangian knot is a knot which lies in the kernel of this thing. And so in particular, when you project it, so I should say first that the rabe, the rabe is just here the, the vertical vector field in the z direction. So when you project the Lagrangian knot into xy space, then it projects to some, if you take it generic, it has double points. And it bounds zero area, if you kind of take the, the y dx integral, it's zero. And, and the rave cores are very easy to spot. So, so they just correspond to, to uh, double points, right? Because it's in c direction. And now, uh, 
one can pick the almost complex structure to be the pullback. So the contact plane field projects, uh, you know, onto this plane so that it is uh, nothing, I don't know what this is, projection, uh, I don't know. It, Funny Ng has beautiful pictures on his website. Great. So, but anyway, so it's a, it's a isomorphism on this plane, right? So, kind of, so, so therefore, you can take a, the standard complex structure here and pull it back to the contact planes. And therefore, you can read off holomorphic curves in the simplexation by projecting them down and see that they project to curves in here. So, in fact, uh, it's possible to compute here by the following. So, we need to distinguish what is a positive puncture and a negative puncture. So, uh, and the rule is that at positive puncture, the holomorphic curve goes up the Rabe cord and at negative punctures it goes down. So here you have such decoration. And then the differential counts holomorphic polygons with convex corners. So that's somehow this index, index, index requirement, if you wish, with one positive and several negative corners. So, so we need to say kind of a few more words to complete this, this description. Uh, so here, in this case, what is this H2 relative? That's just H1 of the naught. So there, there will be kind of one variable in the group ring. And so we fix a point on the naught. Uh, and what more? So the other thing is the signs. So here, signs. Uh, is the following. So the, remember that these, these uh, chords, they have a, a grading, right? So they're kind of, and in this case, I should say what the grading is. So the grading is the following. You start at the top, you go along the note. So I assume the note has mass luminity. So you go along the note, you end up here, and you close it up with a positive rotation. So, so the grading of A is the twice, so that's the mass law, times the rotation number of the positive close-up. Minus one. <clears throat> so, uh, and so there will be negative uh, and uh, the, the, at, the, at the even, so let's see. So, right. I mean, the, the polygons have to be embedded or could they be immersed? They, they could be immersed uh, as long as they, they, can, they can certainly cover themselves, but they, they need no branch points. But they are immersed and they have convex corners. And then now I'm kind of getting slightly confused. But um, uh, let's see. So, so now uh, what you do in order to get the... Uh, uh, which side? So I'm uh, sorry. So, so somehow, I, I, I'm sorry, I should have drawn a better picture. So you somehow, you shade, so I, I'm going to explain signs. Right. So you, you shade at, at each, each even, even index crossing, you shade somehow the, <coughs> if you, if you you shade half of the corners like this. And then in the, in the, in the disk, so we want to have to look at, at papers to get this right. But in the disk, you count the number of shaded corners with a minus one to, to something. So, for example, for the unknot, there is nothing here. So, what is the differential here? D of A. So, this is A. First, let's see what is the grading of A. So, grading of A is two. Uh, uh. It, it rotates once, right, when you do it. So it's a 2 minus 1, so that's 1. And, and there are two disks, two rigid disks, this one and that one. And one of them does not pass through this chosen base point, so that's a 1. And, <coughs> and the other one, there are no shaded corners because there are no even, even corners at all. And the other one does pass through this base point, which means that we kind of view it as going once around the node. So it is 1 plus... I don't know what to call it, maybe mu, which is the homology class of the knot. Right? So you see somehow that, uh, that the, the DGA of this unknot is uh, sometimes, uh, I mean, you, most often it's acyclic actually. But if you take mu equals minus one, then it is not acyclic, so it has something. 
So, um, so that's a. Uh, mu was the mass loss. Mu, mu, no, mu, sorry, mu is is the generator of h1 of 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 of, of our lambda. So this is a co this is a coefficient, right? So the, the algebra. You want q? Uh, mu, uh, mu was mass, okay, maybe, I don't know, t is sometimes used. Let's put t. So t, t is the generator of, of h1 of lambda, which is here the relative coefficient. Okay. So, uh, so I, I was kind of, I'm now, the time is flying here, as Helmut noticed. So, but anyway, so I was asked to give some exercises, so let me kind of give exercise. So exercise, of course, is to compute this for some other node. <coughs> so compute this for the trefoil. Uh, if I can draw it correctly, I'm not sure. I think that's correct. So compute. Is something wrong? Yeah, Is topological true? Sorry, yeah. This should go down, right? Down, under, over. We've done our first homework. I don't know. Just the right trip will on this. Like that, right? I think that looks better. Good. So, so compute uh, DJ for this, and also think a little bit. What is what is the significance here of T? So. This is, of course, a hard question, but why t is equal to minus 1? It's some kind of special thing here and so on. Okay, good. Um, good. So the next uh, step, so, so, so we see that this theory is actually very computable in the simple case that we are in R3 or maybe the surface times R or something like that, we can compute this thing. But we are actually aiming for something a little bit higher dimensional. So we're aiming for, uh, for the unit cotangent bundle of R3, which in fact is the one jet space of S2. So the next thing I want to explain is how, how this thing can be done in one jet spaces. So, so one jet spaces. Oops. So, so <coughs> if you have a manifold M, then the one jet space of M is just a cotangent bundle thought of as, as a differential of the function times R, which is the function value. And on here, there is a nice contact structure, which is DC minus the action form PDQ. And Pretty much as in the case of of, uh, of the plane, where this is actually a kind of special case when we take this M to be R, and this is one jet space of T of, of R. Um, so we, we can also here use uh, we can find so uh, <coughs> pull back the almost complex structure from an almost complex structure on T star M. So in other words, we take an almost complex structure on T star M, the, the contact planes maps again isomorphically onto the tangent place of T star M, and we pull it back to the contact planes and extend it in the usual way in the other direction. And then we have a, we have a similar description uh, of, of the holomorphic curve. So, uh, so again, so holomorphic holomorphic disks. Uh, now correspond to holomorphic polygons uh, of the same nature, but now uh, with, with boundary. On, uh, on the projection of lambda, which is now a Lagrangian submanifold, right? Inside this T star M. 
So basically, it's the same, it's the same thing as for nodes. But now, now our Lagrangian is higher dimensional. And, and it still has uh, some number of double points. And we, we have to find out how to count the polygon. So, uh, but first thing to observe is that the, wherever it went, here, that the, this notion of positive negative corner is exactly the same, right? So you have a crossing, and that at the positive puncture it goes up the rave cord, and at the negative it goes down. So, so we have somehow exactly the same dictionary. And now the question is, how can one possibly count these things? So here we are somehow we're lucky in the sense that we're basically using Riemann mapping theorem. But when the ambient space has higher dimension, there is no such easy way to find all the holomorphic curves. But uh, the idea is that one can degenerate uh, the Lagrangian towards the zero section. So let me try to explain this. Tobias, could you raise the board that's behind, please? Sure. So, so now we have some uh, projection of lambda sitting inside uh, T star M. And, uh, you know, the idea is the following, that if here we have the zero section uh, of M, and then this lambda somehow uh, is exactly Grandian submanifold here, over here. And now what we want to do is we want to, f to scale. So we, we take the, uh, we have some almost complex structure, and then we scale. So, so you know, you take Q comma P, and you map it to Q comma, uh, maybe I take sigma times P, where, where sigma is tending to zero. So what happens <clears throat> is, of course, that this thing is getting skinnier and skinnier and gets closer and closer to zero section. And, uh, and uh, then one can prove that the holomorphic curves, so so the basic case of this is very old. And uh, due to Fleur, that the holomorphic curves, uh, when, when you have a graphical one, they correspond indeed to gradient flow lines of the function difference that this, this uh, graphical thing defines, right? So uh, when you have more complicated things like here, then you cannot say that they correspond to gradient flow lines, but rather they would correspond to gradient flow trees which locally have, locally have the, the uh, looks like a gradient flow line, but then it's, it, it, it's a, some sort of tree that is being, uh, being drawn. So, so let me try to, to explain what, what those are. So I, I'm probably not going to finish that explanation today, but anyway, I can start. So, uh, so that's somehow the main, next main subject of what I'm going to try to, to explain. So this is called gradient flow trees. And I will have to wait till next time. But what I can explain is at least the, the grading formula. Uh, the grading. So when you have this Lagrangian inside the one jet space of M, we projected it to, uh, to T star M, which was somehow holomorphically important. But we can also projected to the zero jet space of M, which is just M times R. And there, it looks, what happens when you project the Lachandrian is uh, that you get the front. And so, um, and so, so, so here is R, and here is this M. And for example, the unknot that we drew before has the following front. And the intersection points Self-intersection points, uh, the, well, how to reconstruct. So here we reconstruct the Q, P coordinate, PI, is equal to the partial derivative of C with respect to QI, where, where somehow, you know, where you locally you have a graph, then you have certain singularities, which I'm not going to talk too much about right now. 
But at least you can see that the double points, they correspond to uh, points on the front. This is a little bit too good, but anyway, points on the front where the tangent planes are parallel, right? So, so here there's one chord in the middle. And now I want to give you the grading formula. Um, So the grading of such a rave chord A is equal to, I should say one more thing, that the singularities, singularities of this front, they have, they are not so hard to describe in low co-dimension. The lowest, the highest uh, strata of the singularities are so-called cusp edges. So they look like that. It's a semi-cubical cusp. So C squared is equal to X cubed is the local Thing here, and then you just multiply it by R in the other direction. And the, those are all the singularities in co-dimension one. So if I pick a path from top to bottom, then I will hit only, only these type singularities. No kind of this co-dimension two, anything I don't have to describe. And the grading of A is the number of down cusps. So that means that I go down the cusp in the C direction, minus the number of up cusps. Um, is it the opposite way with the arrows? It's the opposite way with the arrows. So I go up in the C direction, plus the Morse index. So the Morse index here is uh, I have a critical, if I take the difference, the top minus the bottom, I have a critical point of some function, and the degeneracy condition is that this is a Morse function. I take the number of negative eigenvalues of the Hessian, and then I subtract one. So. For the unknot here in the picture, you see I start here, I go down one cusp, that's one, and I have one for the Morse index, that's two. And so then I subtract one, I get my one back. Okay, so then I, we can expand, I will stop at this, but we can expand, you can now do next exercise without any kind of calculation. So you can compute the higher, so the higher dimensional unknot is this thing, which is a, now here, here this is an, he, oops. Here you have n dimensions, right? x1 up to xn, and this is z. This is the front, so this is an sn minus 1 uh, cuspidal edge. And uh, so compute. And so here, here you can just compute, because you don't, OK, don't have to know anything about trees or anything at all. So you can compute the dj very easily. OK, so, so I will stop at this and continue. Uh, on Wednesday, and then I, I will continue first with the trees, and then somehow try to cover more material. Thank you. All right, any questions for Tobias? Can you just say where the Morse index comes from in the picture again? Uh, yeah, so the Morse, so in general here, so when, when you have, when you're at the point in the base where you have the two parallel tangent planes, if you look at the function, which is the difference, of the upper graph and the lower graph, then you have a function which has a critical point at that point. And that's a Morse critical point. You can take the Morse index of that with, with, with the, the positive function difference, so the top of the ray minus the. Yeah. I don't think the, the right most the double points should probably uh, change that example because the exercise. What do you think? That exercise, the trefoil. The trefoil. The rightmost is wrong, thank you. Yeah, you should go down when you go positive. Thank you, yes. Sorry. It's somehow some convention. That needs to be the same at both ends. But <laughs> okay. Any other questions? So like your theory, it's, um, you have a, how to say, it's sort of a hypercircus and M cross R, and then you tell me something about it. What if I took that whole thing and I just multiplied it by a trivial factor? Yeah. Uh, you go up a dimension by taking uh, that hypercircle <coughs> as one. Mm -hmm. So how, how does the theory change? Is it the same theory or is it? Yeah, so, so if you multiply it by S1, then uh, the theory changes. It's actually one of my next exercises I want to give. But, but indeed, the theory changes. So, so, you ha so basically, over this S1, you have, when you, so when you just multiply, you get the front with very degenerate things. So you have kind of these fa S1 families, right? So you have to perturb it away. So you get one, 
something sitting over the minimum, something sitting over the maximum. Over the minimum, you have exactly a, a copy of what you had before. And over the maximum, you get, um, so, so, so here, here somehow I have a sort of a generator A hat, corresponding generator A here. And when I want to compute this D A hat, then I get, let's say, gamma of D A. So this, what is this D A? D A is equal to some sum of monomials, B1, B2, up to Bm. And, and the gamma of a monomial up to size. So let me forget about signs. So it's doing the following. So it's B1 hat, B2, Bm, plus B1, B2 hat, B3, Bm, plus, and then so it goes. So I just move the hat one. So it's like some kind of homotopy operator, if you wish. So that's what, 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 what it does when you multiply by S1. And when you multiply by R, you kind of have to choose whether you want to live here or you want to live here. So it's, it's not so clear. You have to say what you do at infinity. Okay. All right, how about we thank Tobias again? Thank you. So we all look forward to this polyfold drinking game that will be <laughs> introduced in the afternoon. Um, okay, so, so, uh, so today I want to um, talk about how you would compute this knot contact homology um, in terms of flow trees and then uh, describe some consequences of these calculations. So, so, um, so let me just recall uh, what we're doing, so, so we, have, we have a knot inside R3, uh, and then we take its conormal, unit conormal lift, which is the set of unit, uh, so, so we take the, the points in, in uh, it sits, well, maybe you remember, so I'll say it in words. It sits in the unit cotangent bundle of R3, so, and that's, you, the set of points that lie over the knot and, and, and which have co-vectors that are perpendicular to the tangent vector. And so this is a topologically torus and it's a Legendrian, it's a Legendrian uh, torus. And we want to compute uh, what I call the Legendrian contact homology of, of this lambda k. So that's an algebra. Um, over the group ring, uh, of the second cohomology, so I'll, I'll tell you, well, maybe I'll write it up first like this. Uh, and then generated by rape chords. But let's perhaps <coughs> see what this uh, coefficient ring actually is. So uh, there are basically three variables in this uh, second cohomology. So, so, um, so one is the, so here is the longitude x, here is the meridian p in the torus. So we think of the torus as a boundary of a tubular neighborhood of the knot. And then there is also kind of a, so, so topologically this is just R3 times S2. So there is an S2 class <laughs> as well. So this is actually a three-dimensional, um, space, and so, so the coefficient ring, maybe I know where to write it, I'll write it up here, is actually equal to uh, the polynomial ring on three variables, e to the x, to the p, and then I'll write the last one, q. You can write, think of it as e to the, to the t. But, but this, so, so, so q, q is related to the s2 factor, and x and p related to the to the longitude and meridian on the conormal of the of the of the torus. You haven't written plus minus one on the Q. Just the yeah, I, I should. Thank you. Okay. So um, now, 
the theory that we are going to compute was just a, just again a reminder. So the if we compute the differential of a rave chord A uh, counts holomorphic curves in the simplectization of the following shape. So it has a positive puncture at A and then several negative punctures at B1, B2, B3. And <clears throat> basically the homology variables encodes the relative homology class of these disk capped off suitably. So I won't kind of talk so much about these caps. But if you close it off, then you get a disk with a boundary on this uh, lambda k. Inside here, so it has a second uh, homology class. Right. So, and, 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 and basically, so this is a holomorphic, holomorphic disk with punctures, one positive, several negatives. And so basically, the first goal Today is to, to tell you how one could actually count in this setup uh, such disks. So <coughs> the first observation is that this, this unit cotangent bundle, in fact, is contactomorphic to the one jet space of S2. So uh, the map is just, if you take, say, x in the base here, y in the fiber, so y is the unit vector at x, then, then you map it just to y in the first, and then take the component of x, uh, which is perpendicular to y, and last you take this x dot y. So this is somehow, this is now sort of q, p, and z. So this is contact homomorphism. So in fact, we can, we can compute this by calculating homology, uh, Lesserandrian contact homology in one jet space of a surface. And so let's, let's kind of study this a little bit. So the idea was to use flow trees. And let me now try to describe what they actually are. So if we're given, uh, so this, this just, uh, this is t star s2 times r. So if we're given lambda inside this j1 of s2, we can project it into the zero jet space of s2, which is called, this is called the front projection. And what is it? Well, <coughs> uh, so the, the front then, uh, the front of lambda uh, has so generically two types of singularities. Uh, cusp edge, uh, they have so of course smooth points where it looks like a graph of a function. And uh, this is S2 times R, I should say. Uh, and then it has the following singularities only. So there are these cusp edges where it looks like that. So here, here is somehow is the zero section, and here's the R direction. So it's a, well, OK. So cusp edge. And uh, the other singularity is the swallowtail, somehow looking like that. So it's a <clears throat> cut two cusp edges coming together and the, the, the kernel sort of converting to this cusp direction and swallow takes. So in other words, if, if you have a, uh, a Lachandre and then you can draw it in three-dimensional world, so kind of in S2 times R, you would draw some multigraph uh, and, and that determines for you the Lachandre. So again, Remember that, that <coughs> locally, maybe I'll go on here. So locally here is the zero section, and here somehow is your, your pi of f. Then, no pi of f, pi of lambda. So then, then uh, this gives you, so locally you have z of, say, I don't know, q1, q2. And then uh, you can solve for, for the p-coordinates in terms of of, of the function and the Q coordinates by taking derivatives. Right? So, so the front determines for you the, the Lechandrian. Okay, so, um, but in particular, if you're at this, in general, of course, you may have more than one such, such sheet, and they even may be singular, but let's forget about the, 
the singularity for a bit, so we stay outside the singular locus. Then, over this point, you, you have locally a number, here three, of functions, graphs of functions, right? So, so your Legendrian for you locally defines some finite number of functions, unless you're kind of at kind of some point of the cusp edge where it's a little bit difficult to say what this function is. But for, for generic points in the basis of open dense, outside co-dimension one subset, you have these functions. And so now I want to tell you what is a flow tree. And the flow tree, uh, and the flow trees, first I should say why I'm, I'm going to tell you what the flow tree is. So flow trees. Outside <coughs> co-dimension one or outside co-dimension two? No, outside co-dimension one in the base. So outside, you know, outside the image of this cusp edge, right? Uh, cusp edge is one dimensional, right? So, uh, okay. yeah. So, so when, once you're outside there, you really have sheets. And when you're at the cusp edge, you have a couple of sheets and then this bent thing. Below a crossing is just totally okay. That, that's fine. That doesn't matter if they cross. If they're just, I, I need these functions. Okay, so, so, so I am going to explain to you what are the, these Morse flow trees that we need to count. And they, they will exactly, they, first of all, they're rather finite dimensions, so combinatorial, you can actually find them, which is good, but then they, it will turn out that they correspond exactly to holomorphic curves, so it gives you a calculation of this differential in terms of Morse theory data, basically. Okay. So, um, so a flow tree is a map, uh, let's say U, from a tree, let's call it gamma, so this kind of abstract tree, into, in this case, S2, so into the base. And uh, if I draw it, so, uh, okay. And we require that along each edge, the, the flow tree, Im the, the image of the tree agrees with, so we fix, fix also Riemannian metric on this uh, S2, so we can talk about gradients. So, so it follows the gradient, maybe with, this is of course stupid, right, something like that. It follows the gradient of, of, of uh, these local function differences. And, <coughs> and, and so, so, so you, you sort of have pieces of gradient segments. And then at the vertices, you have certain matching conditions. So you, you always have like a cyclic order or order of, of these things, and, and you can, you see, if you look at this thing, you can actually lift it naturally to, to, the, uh, to the Lagrangian. So here is this minus gradient F i minus F j, but above that, there are these uh, sheets, right? So this somehow is F i and F j, and of course you can just take this line and lift it twice. So you can lift it to somehow to its, uh, uh, to its, uh, <coughs> to the sheet where it belongs, right? So this kind of, you just lift it straight up and there is a kind of orientation rule which I'm not gonna bother you with, but it, it's supposed to look like holomorphic curves. So, so on, the, on the one of them, I think you always uh, orient by minus this gradient. Where we, uh, I'm also, uh, <laughs> can, can you put some more axes on that picture? What, what's ah. You know, uh, I could. So, so here, so this this thing here lives in uh, in the base. So this sits in S two, and uh, and over S two, I, I so, so somehow I have to draw many more axes. So th this this is a big axis containing the fiber. Uh, I don't know the fibers of of T star S two and R actually. I I can think of it as I lift all the way to the Legendrian, right? So the Legendrian lies. So this is a sheet of the Legendre, and this is another sheet. So it's somehow just here projects down, and I, I sort of lift them up. And as long as I'm outside the singularity locus, I'm, I'm fine. So, and I haven't sort of told, told you about this. Yeah, I'm, uh, <coughs> I'm not quite there yet. So, so let, let, but let, let, me draw, let me draw in one dimensional example. It would be kind of, uh, maybe illustrate something. Right, so, uh, So, so just, just uh, in, in dimension one, this is easy to make precise. So he, here we have some kind of x-axis. 
And then uh, here's c axis, so we have this dc minus y dx. And so, so I would have maybe one line like that and one line like this. So this, this is the front, this is my lambda. And if I go over to this xy plane, uh, then, uh, maybe it's better to do that. Um, so then, uh, and, and I have y is equal to dc dx. So, so this zero sheet, one sheet, so zero sheet lying here and one sheet is lying above. And my flow line is just kind of following, of course, it's a stupid thing, it's just in one dimension, but it's lying in the base. But over this thing in the base, I could lift it uh, to either this, this uh, sheet or that sheet, right? That's because they, they're just, uh, just above here. Now, if, if there are more dimensions, there's kind of no, no big deal. It's just a local diffeomorphism, so I can do it. Okay. Um, right. And I now require that when I come to this, this uh, uh, vertices, I want the lift to match, right? So, so somehow, if I look, so now I'm drawing one of these sheets in, into which I lift. So I, I have this incoming thing uh, from, let's say, fi here. Then I should continue in the same sheet, and I should be able to, to, to patch them here. So that the total lift is a continuous curve. So, so ba basically, it would look like boundary holomorphic disk. That's what, what, we, what we want. Um, so, but instead of, instead of, uh, so, so basically, so, so at this, this junction, there is one thing looking like that, and there is one another sheet where it looks something like that, and, and a third sheet where it also looks like this. So there are three local pictures, right? This is somehow, I'm trying to, so this is the picture of some holomorphic, this is one dimensional picture. Where I, where I in, in one, so there is no, in dimension one it's going too straight, but in dimension two it's making a little bend here. This one is this one, and then last I have this one. So they, there are these one, two, three sheets where the three boundary components live of this holomorphic disk, and so that's what it's supposed to look like. Okay, but now for our calculation, this is some, some sort of theorem uh, that I proved many years ago, so, I, so somehow the first people to explore this tree thing was, uh, I think Fukaya O oh wrote a paper about this, uh, where you have, a, here would correspond to having Lagrangian without any singularities at all. So now, what, what I did was I extended to, to the case when there are singularities, and maybe not uh, by now, I guess. So in, in the paper there was some kind of restriction on singularities, but certainly it was fine to do this in demand for, for two dimensions where there are only these two singularities. So, so let me tell you what are the counterparts of this rigid disk that we count. So a rigid... Uh, so do the vertices of the trees, are they meant to stay away from the projection of the singularities? Yeah, yeah, so, I should, so that yeah. the vertices of the trees lie in uh, sort of the good part where you have these... Yeah, I'll, t I'll tell you kind of exactly where, where, where vertices everything now. So, 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 so indeed, the, the, the actually... The vertices need not stay away from the bad part, so they can be there, but somehow the, the tree always begins and ends either at this uh, cusp edge or at critical points. So, but but I'll, I'll tell you. So, so a rigid tree uh, has only the following vertices. So, so they can have valency one, uh, and there it could be a, 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 a rape chord in some sense. So, so somehow, if I, I don't know how to draw, but I'll draw like this. So, so here, here you see, this is a front picture. Here you see a kind of a, a, critical, a critical point. So the, the, this would be a rape chord where you have a critical point. And a, a, a flow line can certainly start there, just like in Morse theory. So this is sort of a Morse, Morse, uh, Morse vertex, Morse critical point, or maybe I should say critical. And it can be of two flavors, just like before. So I, when, when you orient this flow tree, you see, I, either you go 
up, up the rabe cord or down the rabe cord. Up the rabe cord is positive puncture, down the rabe cord is negative puncture, just like for the holomorphic curves. And we look at flow trace with only one positive puncture. So they have critical vertices. And then there is another type of vertex where the tree just goes right into the, to the, to the cusp edge. So that's an end. So you see, of course, you could have it like a flow line coming this way. And then the, it's, it's a positive function difference just shrinking to zero at this. So, so it, 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 it can go there, right? So I should draw one more picture here to make you. So these pictures live in S2 or do they live yeah. in the front? This lives in S2 and this is a somehow a picture of the front over where this S2 picture is. And if I draw the picture in this, this other XY thing, then this is just some kind of holomorphic disk like this. And this uh, is a holomorphic disk like that. Sorry, that, that vertex is still one valent. This is one valent, yeah. And then I have some two valent vertices. So again, I have two valent critical point. So, so that's just in some sense a little bit special case of this, but that's when I want to have, for example, a positive puncture at a minimum. So then I would try to do to flow out of this minimum, but I cannot. There's no, it's just constant flow, right? It doesn't flow out. But if I have some other sheet in between here, then what I can do is I can take this thing and I can split it, and then the things flow in different directions. So that looks like that. So it's a sort of degenerate version of, of some combination of vertices, but, but it needs to be included. It happens only if this guy is a max, it's a max or a minimum. Can, can you label the lines and the sheets on these <laughs> pictures? Yeah, here. Uh. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. Each, each thing of your flow tree should have two numbers attached, namely the two. Yeah. So right. So so here. So I, I'm going now. So here it's, it's a, it goes between flow line two and one, and here it goes between flow line two. Uh, no, sorry, one and zero. This guy is between one, and one and zero, and this one, and maybe it's then between. I mean, I, okay, one and two, right? So th this is this this flow line, and this is this flow line. So, but what's happening to this thing? You've got a red cord, right, uh -huh. which is going, at this, which is an yeah. isolated thing in between one and zero, and then you're flowing. So when you flow, what do you flow? I flow with these. Uh, it, 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 it's yeah. a holomorphic disk. You're yeah, it is. It's, it's, so, so in in this picture, it sort of looks like something like this that that you you just pass by this it's in the very flat thing. You just pass by this. Uh, so, so you see, it, the flow line that just goes. So if, if I draw it. So in the limit, it will be extremely flat. So the flow line that just goes passing by, that, that would be this one that just continues. But it can decide to swap sheets here, right? So that's kind of how, how one should view it here. But what is this limit you're taking? I haven't taken the limit yet. But, I, but what I'm doing is I'm scaling the fibers down. So, in the, in the, so I have a Lachandrian sitting somewhere. And I just scale the fiber so that it's coming closer and closer and closer to zero section. And for sufficiently small. When it's sufficiently close, there will be one, one, one correspondence between trees and disks. So that's, um, I mean, in dimension one, there's maybe this always, but in higher dimensions, it's not. Uh, okay, so, so there, there, this, this is the easy two valent, and then there is the, the difficult two valent, which is called the switch. Uh, so the switch. It's a flow line. So here, here's the cusp edge. I'll call it sigma. It's a flow line between, and I should again label. So I label this this sheet with a. So this is in the bottom, but maybe I'll draw it here. So this is some some other sheet somewhere. It's very difficult to draw. So so here I have a a flow line that that going between the, this third sheet. No, this, this top sheet and, and the lower one, and it starts out creeping up along the lower one, and then it can go up until it's on the upper one. So it can sort of sneak by the cusp edge. So, so it's a flow line that is tangent 
to the cusp edge here, and then it starts out, so here it's on the, on the lower one, and, and it's moving up to the upper one. So, so, so this is unfortunately invisible in dimension one. So this is the, the only true high dimensional input, maybe. Okay. Uh, and finally, there are three, three valent vertices. What is going on in the base in that picture? In the base, you see, um, so, so in the base, I should draw the base maybe more properly. So here's the base, this is S2. And there is somewhere, is the image of this cusp edge, right? So this is sigma. So here, for this sheet, so maybe the multiplicity is zero here and two here, right? So you, you, you cross this cusp thing. And then, and then you have the flow line, which actually is somehow defined only up to this point because then it stops. But, but if you continue it, the flow line is tangent to, 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 the, to the fold. And at this tangency, it switches from one to the other. Okay. And so, yeah. So somehow if you think you have a family of flow lines, then this is picking a specific one that gets stuck onto the sigma. Right. Um, and then the trivalent things. So they're a little bit easier. First there is a, something I call Y0, where, where they're just, so that, that was the one that I drew up there. So just three smooth sheets and then the, the flow comes in between two and decides to split into two. It can happen anywhere somehow. Can you label that? Yeah, so, so I think we could do something like this. So, so basically, when you lift it, it, it will look like this. So this is on sheet zero, this is on sheet two, and this is on sheet one. So it, it's like that. And there is a similar one which, which I call Y1, which involves also the cusp edge, and that's somehow the picture is the same, but, but here is the sigma, and it splits and right, right over the cusp edge. So this is Y1 tree. And, and the picture indeed is uh, the following in terms of fronts, that they have a flow line that comes in and then decides to split into two flow lines between the between the two newborn sheets. So it splits and there are two ways to go there. This Y1 vertex. Okay. And then, uh, <clears throat> and, and now as you see, so, so now our trees, they are in some sense, uh, so they, they kind of complete, right? So they start at critical point and they close up at either critical points or at these ends, right? So, so it's, it's, it will be a, a curve exactly as a boundary of holomorphic curves that goes from endpoints of, of chords to uh, endpoints of chords, right? It's somehow exactly looking like boundary holomorphic curve. And, uh, and the main theorem and reason for saying this uh, So why don't we have n valence? No, so uh, because I look at rigid trees. So, so you can certainly imagine, you know, something like this happening, but that would be in one parameter family. So, so, so but, but when I look at for generic data, which is somehow all I care about, they, they will have only trivalent, maximally trivalent vertices. And, and if you would look at five parameter families, then you would have to look at some deeper tangencies, et cetera, et cetera. So, it's a, so this is the calculation for, for, for uh, rigid trees. Um, if you have two flow lines coming in and meeting each other, mm -hmm. do you demand that they interact in a three valent vertex, or can they just cross? They could cross, they could cross, that's fine. They, that, that's also, it's a, it's a map, right, locally looking like, so they, they can cross, yeah, it's certainly, yeah. It, it, it need not be embedded, this, this boundary. I'm a little puzzled by this picture here, because this <coughs> the two look completely symmetric to me. But it, the, the, the way you're translating it into a disk is not symmetric, because one is playing a different role, right? Yeah. Your, your disk has got boundaries on zero and two. Yeah, and one, and one. And yeah. it also has a boundary on one, yeah. right? So it's a three. So they, they're playing different roles, that's right. But, but, uh, I, I, have, I have here always like kind of cyclic ordering. Order. 
So, so I know which one comes after, and I, I need to, you know, match match the ordering of the because you've got an R action, so you've got your sheets are somehow <laughs> ordered from bottom to top. So yeah, you you could say that, but that, that's not so essential. I just have a local numbering, right. and and when I lift this, it ends up in some sheet, right? right. And 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 actually, I have this orientation convention. So one one of the lifts is oriented towards the puncture, and the other one is oriented away from it, right? So when I come and I go towards the puncture, I know which sheet I should continue on, and I require that it's oriented so that, that it matches there, right? I see. So you're, you're, you're orienting sort of coming in on yeah. the zero two spoke and then going right. out on the other two. Out on the other, so, so that that's it ma it's makes an oriented curve, that's right? That's why it's that, not completely That's right. That's why I can yeah. lift it and it's not so much. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, so, so this is uh, some kind of theory, and it's, it's a, a lot of work to prove that they actually correspond to holomorphic curves. But, yes? Uh, so the, the Morse function I suppose I think of as the Hamiltonian that I was looking at when I was degenerating my curves, right? No, no. The Morse function, you, the, the functions that you're supposed to think about there are the functions locally defined by the Legendrian itself. So the Legendrian gives you locally some number of functions. And the gradient lines are of the differences of those functions. So, uh, so, so somehow, uh, in order to understand this uh, theory, one needs only to do one exercise, actually. So, the, so, so this exercise is the following. It's at the end of my paper on flow trees. So, so, so you take R2. So this is the, the zero section. And then you take some other sheet, which is sloped, say, this way. And then you would get flow lines going from left to right, say. And then you leave the up, up, upper sheet. But on the lower sheet, you somehow you isotope it a little bit so that you introduce a, a ring of singularity. So, and, and actually, this is, well, maybe I should draw. Yeah, I'll try to draw it. So the slice here is this. So this is sort of the first Radomeister move in uh, Legendre North here. So, so you take this ring. And now you just uh, check what happens with this family. So you would find the kind of all, these, all these singularities playing a role. And, and maybe for just um, polyfold-minded people, it's a kind of interesting exercise because um, it shows that these trees, so here, rigid trees are rigid, so they're kind of they're sitting there. But, but, but here you will find trees, somehow looking some way, uh, that have the property that they, they, they live in a one parameter family, but this piece of the tree completely fixed, but that piece is moving. So it's a, somehow these flow trees are in some sense desperately non elliptic. So this is, uh, I think. Oh, could you explain what's more of this? I'm, no, I, I, this will take up all my time, so I will, I will leave to discussion this kind of thing. <laughs> but just, just kind of for reminder of elliptic theory, so somehow a flow tree living in, say, one or higher dimensional family, it can be completely fixed some places and other places move. So this is somehow anti-elliptic behavior, right? So, so I think this, this, this squeezing thing that I have not yet stated my theorem, I should, but but it's uh, doing something rather non-trivial. It's killing some. It's adiabatic limit, so maybe it's not surprising. But uh, okay. So. <coughs> so the main theorem in this business then is that uh, uh, so the the, the Legendrian DGA differential. Uh, can be so the, this the theorem is actually stronger, but let me just state it like this now. So it can be computed by counting uh, flow trees instead of disks. So so we need actually one more one small extension of this. Well, maybe not so small, but one extension of this theory. Um, which is the following. So, you just never have to speak about the swallowtails. 
Did you never have to mention the swallowtail? No, that's right. So, and the reason, I mean, of course, when you try to calculate, they will play some role. But, but the reason is basically this, that the trees that we're looking at, the disc we're looking at, they're rigid. And they have one dimensional boundary. And this guy has co-dimension two. So they should never pass this point, And indeed, they don't. So, so they, but, but of course, when you try to calculate, they would play some role. So these are some kind of extension of this, which we will use. So, so now imagine uh, that you have your sum Legendrian inside this J1 of S2. So this will be actually the conormal lift of the unknot in our case. And assume that you have so this Legendrian looking here, lying here, and then you have some other Legendrian which lying lambda, which lies in a small neighborhood of this lambda zero, right? So lambda zero has a neighborhood which looks like the one jet space of lambda zero. This is a kind of tubular neighborhood in this business. So, so we take lambda inside the one jet space of lambda zero inside one jet space of S2. And now we're interested in counting disks on lambda zero, on lambda. And then, uh, what we do again, we take lambda and, and we, we do this pinching thing, which allows me to kind of relate disks and, and trees. And now, the, the, so I'm, I'm stating this kind of very sloppily, but the theorem is that what you should look for is you should look at disks on lambda, zero, with flow trees growing out on the boundary. So, so basically, you can have a big disk. So, so, so let me draw. So you can have a sort of a big disk, and somewhere in this narrow region grows out these narrow pieces of the holomorphic disk. Like that. So, so basically, if you pretend that you know everything for some reason about holomorphic disks and lambda zero, and you know the flow trees between lambda and lambda zero, then you know all the holomorphic disks you need for lambda as well. So. Uh, and and the, the theorem says that in order to count the disks on lambda, C, lambda, then you can count instead the, what I call naturally quantum quantum flow trees. They they appear in many other guises called cascades and whatnot. So it's okay. Um, right. So now let us actually let us actually try to apply this machinery to calculate the knot contact homology of the unknot. So, so, so the plan, I should say, what the plan is, the plan is actually to calculate the knot contact homology for the unknot, and then it will actually be quite easy to calculate for any knot. So what's the, what's the strategy? So strategy is as follows. Yes? So in the theorem, is something that's allowed to have two disks on lambda knots connected by a flow tree? No, no. So we, because we have just one positive puncture. So such a guy would have to have two positive punctures in this case. But in general, if you count everything, then, I mean, if you look at all arbitrary holomorphic curves, such things would happen. But here it won't. So, so it's much easier. In some sense, the action can only flow down. <laughs> it can never. Oh, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, right. So, um, <clears throat> so the, the plan for calculation is as follows. So, so, you know, we take the unknot, and that defines, uh, that gives us this co-normal of the unknot, which is a torus. And now if you take any other knot, you can braid it around the unknot. So this is kind of k. And that, that gives you this lambda k. But then, in fact, if you think about it, this lambda k sits now inside some one jet small neighborhood of lambda u. So in order to calculate the thing, we'd need to understand all the holomorphic disks on lambda u, and then all the trees between lambda k and lambda u. And this is actually kind of one can do. And let's start with lambda u. So first we need to draw the thing. Uh, so, 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 and we take this. Uh -huh. We take the u to be just a, exactly like round circle in the in the x1 x2 plane, and so we are trying to draw its front. So remember what what was somehow this 
Here is a zero, strangely. Uh, but, <laughs> but anyway, so, so <laughs> what was this last, uh, the last uh, coordinate? So that was somehow C over in, in one jet space of S2, or zero jet space of S2. That was uh, C was equal to uh, position dot uh, covector. So somehow now we have in the co norm we need to understand what's happening to this this little circle of covectors, and then somehow we would be done. So I'm going to draw it for you. It's very easy. So here is the S2. This is the zero section, and I I will draw the R axis to be just like. Uh, you know, starting at the origin, going to infinity. So the lift of this circle, so here, when I'm here, the y dot, the position vector is positive. So I would, and, and uh, over at the poles, it is zero. So I would get some kind of circle like this, right? So, so somehow, I, 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 it's the circle that I see, and here the function is positive, and here it is negative. So that's it. But now we have symmetry, so we can just swing it around. So the actual lift, the front of the co-normal lift, is this strange torus, mapped with two singularities, which looks like cone, cones over the poles. And where are the rabe cores? Well, the rabe cores, so this is not, uh, unfortunately a little bit gen non-generic, so I will perturb it in a second. But the, the cores first, they actually, they come in, a, in an S1 family, right, over the equator. There's a whole... S1 family of quartz, which corresponds to actually binormal geodesics in here. So, so one should have said, but I didn't. So, so anyway, you have these quartz. And, <coughs> and if you perturb it a little bit, so you can make it short on one side, you get the chord C, and long on the other side. And then remember this grading formula we had, and the grading formula says that the grading of C is 1. And the grading of E is 2. So in order to calculate the differential, we only have to care about what happens to C. And, uh, and you see, that it's pretty clear what happens, right? We have two flow lines going out from C. One goes up, up towards the pole, and one goes down towards the pole. Now, unfortunately, pole is a little bit degenerate, so we need to perturb it and then to see what's really going on in terms of flow trees. Two flow, so uh, maybe I should use color short. So, th so the the yellow, the yellow thing here is the zero section. Okay, the white thing are graphs of that's the front. So they define a function, graphs of function. So here, if I'm standing at this point, I have exactly one function difference. The difference between this sheet and that sheet. And if I follow the gradient flow that decreases kind of function. Then I just flow straight up to the pole. Right? So there are sort of the, the flow lines that we see. There are two such flow lines, one going up, one going down. Here it's a little bit unknown what happens because it's too non-generic. But I will perturb it so that it becomes generic. Right. So this is also a nice exercise. What happens with this Lagrangian cone when you perturb it? Uh, one can say many things, but it somehow is in, in the middle. It's the middle stage of a circular version. But, but anyway, so if, if I draw this, so here is the cone, and if I draw it from the top, it somehow looks like this, right? So you have two, <coughs> two sheets, and there is a somehow a dot in the middle. Now I'm going to try to draw, draw for you what it looks like when I, when I resolve it, and I will draw the projection because it's simpler. So there will be four cusps, and two double lines, and outside here, it of course looks exactly the same. So this may be kind of um, slightly difficult to see the first time you, you think about it, but let me draw the movie, maybe. Yes? Can I get this picture by perturbing this? Ab absolutely, yeah, so if you perturb this. I don't know, perturbing this. The unknot, yes, yes you can. So you'd have to uh, roll it up a little bit along a cylinder instead of having it in the plane. So you would find four inflection points, which are these, these guys here. But, but this you cannot get by perturbing. 
this guy actually. You can never get two rave chords, two binormal chords. You would always have, because they, they count with orientation. So you, you'd always have four if you do it. So you're sort of thinking in this picture that you have a top circle which, which uh, abuts on the, uh, which goes to the two top faces of that tetrahedron, and you have a back, a, a bottom disc which abuts on the back two faces yes. of that tetrahedron. Yes. And then you attach them along the tetrahedron. So you sort of think of removing the interior of that tetrahedron. Yes. And two of them will be two smoothed like this, and the other one smoothed. That's right. Yeah, you can imagine. Right. That's right. Yeah. So maybe I don't have to draw the movie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Maybe, maybe I'm, I'm not drawing the movie. So. Uh, so. So. Anyway, what is the? If if you look, so this is in the front, and the, the Lagrangian lift of this is is just a cylinder, like this, and somehow the middle circle is completely killed in the projection. So, okay, and now we need to figure out what's going on with these flow trees, so we go up here, and in fact, one of them looks like this. I should draw it with some other color. One of them looks like this, and the other one looks exactly the same in the beginning, but I won't draw it exactly the same, and then it splits over here. And in this picture, it corresponds to the disk coming from here and coming from here, and it can go either this way or that way. So there's somehow these, these two options. So one, the, the eye-shaped disk is maybe is this one. What is that cylinder? This cylinder is the pre-image of this in the Lechandrian itself, right? So in the Lechandrian, this is, this is almost uh, isomorphism, except it crushes the middle circle. And when I draw the boundary of this, this, the lifts of this trees, it basically looks like this. One goes down one way, and the other one go, goes down the back. So there are these two curves, and when you lift them, are non-homotopic, right? They kind of differ by this. So in fact, we have four disks, and we find that this DC is equal to um, uh, one, and there are some signs here which I won't discuss right now, minus e to the x, minus e to the p, plus q e to the x, e to the p. So uh, I'm, I'm also not, because I'm sort of running out of time, so I'm not going to tell you about the q. Right now it's somehow, basically, no, I, I am going to tell you about the q. So basically you have to count intersection numbers of these disks which are just the lying ab above the flow lines with some fiber. And then if you take this fiber, I think, to lie here, then you get exactly this calculation if it's up on the North Pole. This is a choice again of capping path and so on. But you see that the, there are four disks and they live in, in four different homotopy classes. So first you were telling us there's two disks, and so now you're telling us there's four disks. <laughs> now I'm telling you there are two flow lines that we see starting from here, right? But then what, what's going to happen up here, that's not clear from this picture. We have to see how would they continue. So I, I have two, I have exactly two flow lines going, go, one flow line going up up to this point. But then there are different histories, one going straight and one going... And again, uh, kind of, even here, illustrating this not so super elliptic. It was super elliptic. <laughs> I mean, the, the two maps actually agree here, right? So that's uh, not so elliptic to then not agree. Okay. So, uh, so this is our, our calculation, and uh, uh, and I'm somehow desperately much behind time, behind schedule. So let me try to to do something with this calculation. So now uh, the one key thing that will appear in the talk tomorrow is what's called the augmentation. I, I should also say what is this D of E. The D of E is easy, <coughs> it's actually easy to see that this D of E is just a Morse differential, so it's C minus C, so that's zero. So, <coughs> so I wanted to talk about the augmentation. Augmentation uh, variety, which is probably the most important uh, Invariant derived from this contact homology. So, so we have this. We have our algebra, this A of lambda k, and um, we can look at the locus where you have a chain map 
into integers. So maybe I will switch at some point to some other coefficients, but it doesn't matter. Uh, I'm sorry to ask this, but yes. you've got two E's in that picture. You've got, you've got the E, which is the generator, and then you've got <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And DC, C is one yeah, dimensional, and D, does that go two, two. down in dimension? Yeah, the, the differential decreases grading by one. So you in, that should be multiplied by E, then? That's a, no, that's just no. a coefficient you've got. No, no, I mean, E is stupid. Let, let me change to something else. F, no, maybe F is well, a function. A. A? a? What about A? But then DC, if it goes, that DC is one dimensional. So this should be a multiplying by that generator then? No, A, a has degree two, right? Right. And, and, and C appears in its boundary. So that's degree one. So the differential decreases degree by one. Oh, it decreases degree by one. And the, and the, oh, constant, the constants all are degree it zero. It yeah. just Goes into the ring, which is degree okay. zero. So, okay. yeah, so, thanks. Um, right. Wait. So the augmentation variety uh, is the is the locus. Uh, so I should say is the locus of the. Of in, in the in the space kind of e to the x e to the p and q, where uh, there is a chain map uh, like that. Um, right. So so let let's take a look at this our one and only example. What, what is this locus? So uh, uh, where uh, chain map where this has the trivial differential. And it lies in degree zero. Okay. So, so here for the unknot, this is somehow extremely simple, because the only thing that it requires, and this, the only thing that it requires is that uh, uh, the image of the differential degree one is killed by this map, right? So, because uh, so this, 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 we will try to try to define maybe epsilon, and the image in the differential has to be killed. So, so we see the equation. So the equation for the augmentation variety uh, is equal to uh, one minus e to the x minus e to the p plus q e to the x e to the p. Okay, and now. Uh, in the last few minutes, let me somehow just very fast explain what happens with a general note. Um, so I, I'm, I'm going to follow this. Well, maybe I'll keep the augmentation right. Follow this strategy uh, and tell you sort of how it goes. Um, and you mean the variety is where that vanishes? The variety is right. That's right. Uh, that's right. So the variety is the zero set of this thing, which is is the augmentation polynomial. Thank you. Right. So um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. And this can stay. Yeah. So, so if you have a, uh, a general knot, then as indicated on the top board, we will braid it along the unknot. And in fact, uh, so so here I'm drawing strangely the unknot as a straight line, and then the braid will consist of some strands here. But in fact, what you can do is you can have these strands all kind of increase along the knot, except you have to close them up when you're here, right? So, 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 so somehow, because, you know, what is a braid? Braid kind of turning, but you can certainly keep on going outwards and turn and just kind of have the outwards motion dominate, right? So that means that there will be no binormal chords at all here. Rather, all of them will be here, etc. So, so, so if you have a brand on n strands, 
then you have chords sort of A, I, J here and B, I, J here. <coughs> and they, they go both ways, right? So you have something like 2 n squared from here, right? And all the twisting takes place in the, pl in the point where they're going up, so it's sort of in yeah. between. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, straight. Yeah, it's a completely straight here, so the twisting does not really interact with the chords at all. That's right. right. Then, if you look at it from the top, you see, now I should draw this thing extremely close to the original one. So you see that there will also be these, these chords that correspond to the chords on the unknot, right? So, so you will have some kind of chords C, I, J, and let's call the other ones not E, because I call them A, no, not A, you see? <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> okay, so I call them A, I, J anyway, okay, with the twiddle. So, okay, so, 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 so there are remnants of the long chords on the unknot, uh, that, that, that goes between different sheets. Okay. And now, um, what we need to do, we need to understand what are the flow trees on the, on this torus. And in fact, uh, so this lambda k inside j1 of lambda zero is given by, by the function, so let, let me sort of introduce some more coordinates. So here I have my circle, I have a coordinate s along the circle, and then I have some, uh, then I have some uh, coordinate xi, say, along the, along the, uh, ve 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 in, in the, in the, this is a d2, so in the neighborhood is s1 times d2. And this one is given by the, so, and, and if I have a, my kind of braid here, so that, that defines for you a vector f j of s, the j strand, in this disk, right? So, so somehow as a function of s, the point is moving in the disk as I go around, and the function of this guy is just f j of s dot xi. So this somehow is the, the function that generates this, this front, oops, and it makes it not so hard to, to find the flow lines, etc. So let me just tell you very briefly what happens. So, so here I'm now drawing, this is the front of the, this is the front of the unknot lambda zero. It needs a torus and I'm drawing it like kind of like a square. Um, and the yellow lines are what's going to the poles. So this somehow is the pre-image of the, the cone point. And then uh, when I, my, if my strands, so my, my, my AIJs and BIJs, they will be here. Uh, AIJ, BIJ. And this is actually AJI, JI and BJI. It doesn't matter so much how I encode this. So if my, my strands just go completely straight, then the relevant stable and unstable manifolds here just go completely straight like this, all of them. So this is the only, the only stable and unstable manifolds, whatever they are, where the function differences stay positive. So if, if I, there are also flow lines kind of falling down here, but then very rapidly the function difference become negative and I cannot find any trees. So my trees have to kind of follow these things. So for the unlink, the cal calculation is simple. Now, what happens when I introduce a twist? When I introduce a twist, I change the flow line like this. So it's going instead like that, and this one is falling down here and coming back up, right? So, so now, in order to count the trees, you just need to keep track of how many times did it intersect something here. And so it's not kind of terribly difficult to do. It some, takes some combinatorial skills to be able to organize this. But then basically, uh, you can find all the trees by composing these things. So, so sort of one tree will look like that, and then you feed this to the next thing, and there will maybe be another tree like this. So, and then you eventually you co collect them up here. So this is one piece of the, uh, I'm going to say something for two more minutes, this is one piece of the calculation. But note that in this 
picture, if I draw this kind of carefully, I can also draw the images of all these other big holomorphic disks. So they look something like this. So I need to make sense out of this big disk with flow trees kind of attached on them. And, and this can also be read off from this picture. So basically, this picture tells you everything and gives you a similar uh, expression. So let, let me just very schematically finish by saying what, how you deal with the augmentation polynomial. So, so what, what you get is some sort of, and I, I will, uh, yeah. so, so, so you will have uh, in degree, in degree one, you have Cij's and Bij's. And in degree zero, you will have Aij's. Okay. And basically, so you, you find something like this, that D of Cij and, and constants. How about A tilde Ij? No, they are these short Aij's, these, these guys. Uh, the a tilde ij has degree two, so they 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 w w would have been eij, but no, they're a tilde. <laughs> but they they degree two, so I don't have to care so much. So, so so this dc ij and equal to this bij, that's in if you think about it, this this is just some kind of polynomial. I don't know, pcij in the aij's, right? And this is some other polynomial, PBIJ, in the AIJs. So, uh, and now what we want to do, we would, we're sort of obsessing about this augmentation variety or polynomial. And how to find it? Well, we need to find values where all these polynomials have common roots. Right? So basically, you can find this augmentation polynomial by elimination theory. Right? So, so, so you, you have to take your note, you sort of write it down like this, draw this picture, and find there's actually there's a formula from a braid presentation. You take this thing, and then you, 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 you do elimination theory, you get the polynomial. And this polynomial is called augmentation polynomial, and in this case, the elimination theory is extra simple, right? Because there's kind of nothing to eliminate, but, but, <laughs> but in general, it's more complicated. So, uh, Maybe let me f finish by, f by stating what I wanted to say and then and maybe one exercise. So the ideal exercise here is maybe the simplest exercise. You say calculate for hopefully, right? And somehow the Q is the Q is somehow related to having something on this from this disk. So you calculate, or trefoil if you wish, that's a little bit more difficult. So calculate for hopefully and find this augmentation polynomial. Or augmentation variety, here it's more complicated. Okay, um, so what I intended to, to say and actually also to prove was the following, that uh, the, uh, the theorem <coughs> is due to Lenin and there's also some other Myself and Silibak and Larchev. This, this is the original proof, and then the other proof is some other by string topology somehow. But that, that's showing that that in fact the augmentation. So the the so one could say that the not contact homology uh, knows knows the unknot. So that one can prove. Uh, directly using some kind of relation to fundamental group or actually grouping of fundamental group. And that's how, how we go about it in this paper that is in the makings is soon ready. Uh, but Lenny proved something maybe stronger. So he proved that, and it's not so hard to see from this string topological thing. So he proved that this uh, e to the two minus p times the a polynomial of the knot, which is a polynomial in e to the x and e to the p, divides uh, the augmentation polynomial at e to the x and e to the p, 2p, and q is equal to 1. 
So, and the A polynomial by work of Kronheim Rovka, no, by work of other people using Kronheim Rovka, I don't know, it recognizes the unknot. So there's a, somehow, if you're not unknotted, you have some interesting representation of fundamental group of the complement into SU2, which gives you some, so A, A polynomial is something derived from SL2 representation of the knot, knot group. And uh, so, 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 so in fact, this augmentation polynomial uh, strictly contains the A polynomial and the starting point from um, uh, for tomorrow's talk is that from this, this augmentation polynomial therefore gives you kind of a deformation of the A polynomial. That was also found by other means from, uh, from physics and, and uh, the tomorrow's talk is to kind of relate it to and to talk about what's coming after this relation has been established. So I'll stop at this. So, so in higher dimensions, it's still true that the cusp locus has co-dimension one and higher singularities than lower co-dimensions. So, so like, what, why do you need restrictions on the singularities? No, you don't. The, the answer is that you don't, but it's, it's, uh, it requires proof. Because, you see, if you take a holomorphic curve, uh, then certainly you can say that the, it's bound, a rigid holomorphic curve, its boundary does not pass through any of these bad things. But now you're taking a rather bad limit, right? You, you're squeezing the... Lagrangian or Lagrangian, if you wish, down to, towards the zero section, where basically everything you like about holomorphic curve theory, like this uh, estimate between the internal metric and external metric, everything is blowing up in the wrong way. So, so one has to prove that also in the limit, you can preserve preserve this 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 property. So, so it's it is true, but. Uh, we wrote something that we never really finished, but 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 it's a non-trivial statement because it's very hard to control this transality in the limit, right? So, so what restrictions do you have? Do you need? So, in the paper that I wrote, I basically do exactly these two type singularities. Uh, but but in general, you can do it generally, and you don't have to know anything about these other singularities except that they have higher co-dimension. So, so it is, it is uh, a theorem in the writing, but, but, but it's, there is something to prove. You cannot just state that because they're rigid, they won't go there. Because in, in the limit, you, you don't really have your favorite elliptic theory anymore. Yes? Uh, in polynomial is somehow SL2 story. So there is SL an element of the polynomial. Yes. We have a similar story in your... Yeah, so, so in fact, uh, what turns out that uh, the... This uh, divide, but there are some additional factors here. So it's not this is not equality; it's just divides. And these additional factors come actually from from uh, other such representation like GLN. So 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 this knows uh, in some sense about all these f flat connections on the not common. <laughs> that's not true. That's not true. That's not true. It knows about the ones with sort of. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We, we, that looks like. Uh, it looks like you can use for yeah right right, right. But, but you can take higher rank representations of this augmentation of this uh, algebra. You have to represent it somewhere else to get one. So I mean, if you always rank one representation of this algebra, you can take higher rank representations of this algebra. And, and that knows the other. And then you're saying that the Lagrangian variety which should replace the equal and on yes. yes. Yeah. So that's right, and which would correspond to taking sort of parallel copies of this torus, right? So 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 indeed so. Yeah. Okay, well, I think we should wrap up the discussion because it sounds very interesting, but it could obviously go on for a So let's thank our speaker again. Thank you very much. So, um, so I'm going to continue this uh, series of talks and today uh, it will be a little bit different. So I want to talk about um, how this knot contact homology is related to some bits of sort of physics. And so I, I will have to talk a little bit about um, a little bit about physics and that will be kind of sketchy and uh, imprecise and so on, so maybe not kind of in the, in the spirit of 
of uh, Helmut's polyfolds, but, but anyway, I hope it will be interesting and it will be kind of brief. But, but the first thing I, I want to continue from last time, so remember that uh, we did do one calculation. So, so if you took the unknot, so there was just the unknot, and then, then we actually looked at uh, its co-normal, um, lambda u sitting inside uh, this unit, co unit cotangent bundle of R3, which we observed was just equal to one jet space of S2. And this was somehow the only calculation we really carried out. But, but there we could draw, if you remember, we could draw the front. Uh, and there was some kind of torus. Oops, not so great picture, but it, it, it looked like that. And the, there was somehow these four disks on it, which, so this is just recollection, so of course it's in understandable to anybody who didn't listen last time, but we could find these four holomorphic, curve, holomorphic disks using flow trees, and uh, there were two generators for this, uh, and uh, I'm sorry, does I have to, <laughs> if she's not here then it's fine, so two generators C of degree one and E of degree two, and uh, and, the, and the algebra was just <coughs> the following, that dE was equal to zero and dC was equal to one minus e to the x minus e to the p plus q e to the x e to the p. So where, where the, remember the coefficient ring was somehow this e to the x e to the p and q which was encoding the um, this x is the longitude on the, on the conormal torus, p is the meridian, and q is the class of the S2. So this is kind of relative homology class. Okay, so, so now uh, we first looked at um, the special case where we, we so, so and, then, and that was also the augmentation polynomial. So the augmentation polynomial of this u was just equal to this expression. Uh, Like that. And now let's put q equals 1 here. So, uh, And then the augmentation, if we restrict this augmentation polynomial to q equals 1, uh, then what we get is 1 minus e to the x minus e to the p plus e to the x e to the p, which is equal to 1 minus e to the x, 1 minus e to the p. And this actually is no accident. So, so it turns out that this two factors uh, divides the augmentation polynomial of any knot. So I want to kind of try to, to show that. Uh, and it gives you this somehow using, uh, using some standard property of this SFT package. This is always when you specialize q equals 1 for, for the other knots. Yeah, right, exactly, yes. Yeah. So, 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 so I'm sorry, so I should state probably like theorem, so theorem. Uh, uh, so for any k, uh, the augmentation polynomial of k, specialized at q equals 1, is divisible by this 1 minus e to the x, 1 minus e to the p. So why is that? So, so in fact, uh, this comes from, uh, so, so the proof comes from cobordism maps in, in this Lechandrian uh, I'll draw the picture right here. So, so much like we defined the differential in this uh, uh, contact homology DGA, you can also define a chain map. So in this case, we have lambda k sitting inside this u star R3, and, <coughs> and it bounds. It's the ideal boundary of the, say, full co-normal. Uh, where the, the co-normal sits inside T star, T star R3. And this guy is exact, and that's somehow important for this argument. And then this LK actually induces a chain map, epsilon, from the algebra uh, of, of the unknot, or of the knot, maybe, I'll, uh, maybe this was the notation, into <coughs> integers uh, that counts where uh, 
where, and I'm drawing the picture. So if I want to count epsilon of a rave chord A, so this is equal to a count of moduli spaces, which I schematically draw like this. So I have a positive puncture at the rave chord A, and then the disk goes down, and the boundary lands on LK, right? So, <coughs> so now, what I would want to do is I want to check that this is a chain map. And the, the chain map comes from this SFT compactness result, namely, and, and gluing, but uh, why, why is it chain map? So, uh, so what, what you need to do, so this, this I should say I count rigid, so I, I write this, so this maybe bad for, for later, but this zero, this maybe I write D equals zero. So this dimension is equal zero, so I count rigid such planes. But now if you think about, instead looking at the moduli space of D equals one such thing, so then its boundary, so the boundary of this thing, is exactly two level buildings, which on the top has this D equals one disk, and on the bottom, the second level is D equals zero disks like that. And now that means indeed that this is a chain map, right? Because the, the boundary of this one dimensional moduli space now consists of such things, and they, they're exactly the uh, they're exactly the, the, the things that contribute to this kind of phi composed with D. It's there for zero, and this is a chain map. So this is this is an augmentation. And what does it do on the on the on the homology variables? Well, on the homology variables, so the only homology variables surviving is P and X. And on the homology variables, it's just the inclusion map. So, so this kills, so this maps e to the x, uh, sorry, e to the p, the meridian, is mapped to 1, right? And e to the x, you can, you can use the homology variable remaining in this lambda k and map, map into kind of e to the x, right? So, 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 so this shows that this factor is in the augmentation polynomial. And so, we would like to also see that the other factor is in the augmentation. Yes? You can see that again, like Pastor Bruce said, you can see that there's a reason why, why this factor divides the augmentation for the Yeah, so, so this map, if you want to, so how, how do you count these disks, right? So, so remember you had some kind of capping here. So you count them uh, by counting their, their, how much they wrap around the kind of, generator of, the, this guy is just S1 times R2, right? And, and the R2 or D2 fills the P variable, right? So the, the map does not see if this disk, uh, the, the, it kills the P variable, right? It is somehow just inclusion map on homology from torus to the solid torus is identity on A, it takes X to X and P to zero. And that's what this map does as well, right? So, so if, that means that if I, if I put e to the p equals 1, and I define my chain map like this, I have a chain map. So therefore, e to the p equals 1 is in the augmentation uh, variety, and this factor sits in the polynomial, okay? Right, so, so we'd like to understand why this, this thing is here, and it's there for a similar reason, because there is another, there is another uh, feeling that fills out uh, x, and let, let's try, there are many ways to see this, but one way is, uh, of seeing it is, um, uh, uh, maybe here it's better to use <coughs> S3 than R3. So I haven't this but let, let me anyway use S3 rather than R3. So, so here is S3 and here is R0. And then I have the co-normal kind of going out like this. I don't know how to draw it. But you see, if the co-normal intersects the, the zero, zero section along the knot, then I can there, I, so basically Lagrangians looks like that, and I, I can now surger them so that I get this thing. And, and what do I do? So what, what I do is I, I take a zero section and I join the co-normal, and the topology of what I get is actually the not complement, right? So I have another filling, which is slightly more complicated. It kind of goes down and then spreads over S, S3, so, but, but that's the topology, so I, I can sort of do it is exact, yeah. So, or if you if you want to see that from the beginning, you can take a function 
Morse function that sort of explodes just along the note, right? And take the graph of that. So, so, so I have another feeling, let's say mk, which topologically is just S3 minus the naught, and, and, and that, if I just care about it, it's, it's a kind of, of course, interesting topology here, but if I care about the homology, it's not so interesting. It exactly kills the, the longitude and the, keeps the, the um, meridian. So, so therefore, I, I also have this factor explained by counting disks on this other Lagrangian. So, so these two exact Lagrangians, they somehow give me these factors, and that's, that's a kind of proof of this theorem. I guess I wasn't paying attention. What was the first Lagrangian? The first was just the cone normal itself, so Lagrangian cone normal itself, going down to the zero section, this one going down to zero section. So now, and, and as you see, th this works great for this Q equals one. And remember that Q was somehow, Q was related, is the E to the T, where T is the class of this S2. So here we feel the S2, and it's very hard to recover Q. And so what, what, what now I want to explain is what, what's, what's with augmentation polynomial when Q is not equal to 1, and how can we see it geometrically there. And that turns out to be related to a, a lot of physics, so I, I want to kind of give just a very brief description of this physics so that Otherwise, it's somehow very hard to guess where things come from. So, um, and it's a sort of more like an overview advertisement or something. And, and it's, 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 it's a long story in physics. But, but anyway, the starting point for this story is, is Chern Simon's th theory. And that's a, <coughs> has been, from, from physical point of view, is you have a three manifold. And then you have a churn simons action, so say S of, of a UN connection, so <coughs> three manifold M. And then, and A maybe I should say, UN connection. And then you take this this uh, action form, so so this action form is somehow not quite gauge invariant, but it, it, it uh, changes, it comes from some characteristic class in four dimensions, so it changes by multiples of four pi if you change the gauge um, thing. And then, and then in physics you would write down the path integral, uh, which is a function of the, of the underlying manifold. And, since it's a path integral, it's hard to understand. So you integrate over all gauge equivalence classes of connections, and you take this e to the i k over 4 pi, where k is an integer called the level uh, of this uh, churn simons action. So this uh, object, from a mathematical point, does not make sense. But you can treat it uh, with, with Feynman perturbation theory. and and get something, in the, and, and basically, if you do that, you get an expansion in terms of, so maybe a yeah, expansion uh, in terms of, of k, which is this level, and, and n, which is the uh, uh, which is the the uh, UN, right? So, okay. Um, and then the starting point for, for, for our relation is actually Witten's old result from, uh -huh. that happen? Uh, from 1992. Uh -huh. so you said the integral doesn't really well defined, but you can do some Feynman perturbation to. Yeah. Approximate it, or right. You can expand it. Uh, uh, so the, the critical points of this action functional are the flat connections. So you can kind of expand it around the these flat connections in some kind of fine final expansion. And I'm, I'm not gonna. This this the, there were a lot of, of things done about that, and I'm not gonna talk about it. But uh. right. Um, so, but so 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 Witten 
in 92 uh, saw that this, this churn simus is actually related to, to uh, topological string theory, which is somehow, in our world, would be some gromer witten theory. So, so, <coughs> so, so what he says is that this churn simons uh, <coughs> churn simons uh, partition function is equal to a certain count. So it's really like coming from topological string theory, but when it localizes, it's a, it's a gromer witten uh, invariant. And it's a, it's a little bit strange gromer witten invariant from our point of view, but it's the count of holomorphic curves living in the cotangent bundle of, on M, of M with boundary on the zero section, but, but you, have to take, you have to take N copies. So, so somehow you, you imagine it's like this. You're multi-sections, but not perturbed, and the total weight is N. So you, you have exactly N copies of it lying on top of each other. And these such, if you, so, so the kind of, here would be string coupling constant. So this is the genus parameter that you use when you expand this, just like in SFT. So that's equal to, to this thing, this change of variable. So, so basically, what, what Witten is saying that is you're supposed to count holomorphic curves in T star M with the boundary on M. Now, being kind of well-educated symplectic geometry, you see that there are only constant such, such maps. But uh, if you look at formally the dimension, you see that this is a three-dimensional collab yau manifold, and the, the zero section has Maslow index zero. So formally, any such disk is rigid, so there should be a count. And, and, and uh, he invented something called string field theory to relate it directly to the churn simons count. So, but I, I think you know, this is, would be a kind of great, uh, great polyfold project to make sense out of this count, I think. But, um, no? So if I set k equal to zero, is, is, it, is it somehow clear that the right-hand side is not making sense? Mm. Which k? The, k? the level of the churn simons? Yeah. Or, uh, right, then the churn simons yeah. tries to just integrate over the whole space of connections. Which yes. Right, so then it should not really make sense, right? you're right. Right, so then the right-hand side also shouldn't make sense. The right-hand side. Yeah, makes sense, okay, sorry. But I mean, are we excluding k for some reason, k equal to zero? No, no, no. I think not. It's supposed to say for k equal to zero. I mean, this quantity is the Hanfley polynomial. The right-hand side. Yeah. It will be in a one. So is there some... Is some specialization of it. Is there some idea of how I should get that just from the space, from the function one on the space of connections? Uh, well... What, what, what do you complain about the space of connections? If I set k so equal to zero. Do so you want to compute somehow the volume of this space, right? That's what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, I, I don't know, how, so I, I didn't think about it much in these terms, but in terms of the kind of coefficients in the expansion. But of course, these coefficients should somehow mean something if you could go back. In, on that side, yes, but maybe perhaps not on this side, right? That's a, right? Yeah. No, I, I don't have good answers. I, I need to think, but this is, of course, a kind of... Uh, normalization of this volume. It, it will come out, as you're saying, this is not quite a Homfly polynomial yet, because we have no naught, right? But it will become, it will become, and we will normalize is it. Is it when, the, when there's no naught in my three manifold? What is the churn simons at the coefficient, the constant coefficient? Partition function is not really meaningful. It's only like right. other expectation value divided by partition function, which is meaningful. The so sure. of M is all along some sort of normalization constant. Sure, but and maybe, maybe, let's and, take and, and, N equal to 1, K equal to 0. I, 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 and so, like, it's totally okay for that normalization constant to be infinity, which it might be. Right. But still, when I evaluate at some other naught, and I divide that by this infinity, I oh, get a meaningful answer. Sorry, that statement there. Should let's be. save this for discussion. Yeah, anyway, I think this all is right. a good discussion topic that will happen after lunch. Yeah. So, right. Let me kind of go one step further, and perhaps I can. Perhaps this will answer your question. So, um, so then the next step in this story is somehow due to <coughs> Oguri Bafo, 
and they they want to somehow um, the, the, so they, 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 they use what's called this conifold transition and it's a way to relate uh, various string uh, theories, open, open and closed string theory. So it, it's also not understood, I would say well understood mathematically, but there is a physical proof of this strange uh, correspondence. So here, this is a picture of T star this picture of T star S3 with n copies of the zero section. And then, um, you know, T star S3 you can view as a quadric in C4 and, and, and you can pinch it to, to a cone uh, where I basically pinch the zero section. But now you can resolve it the other way. So, Instead of, the, this indicates that I fill in the S2 by a disk topologically. Instead I can fill in the S3 by a disk topologically. So what I get topologically is somehow just S2 times R4, but it appears nicely if I use this algebraic geometry language as the, the O minus one bundle over CP1. And now uh, what, <coughs> What, what the, this physics prediction says, or the physics theorem is, that the, if I do the open, this Gromov Witten over here, then it's related to closed theory of closed curves here. So, um, I'm running out of blackboard, maybe here. And um, I have to require some relation between the areas here. And that, that the, so I, I take the area of this CP1. So that's a kind of Kähler parameter on, on this manifold is T. So that's finite and that's equal to the, the coupling constant, the string coupling constant times N. So I'm sort of letting N go to infinity and this going to zero in a controlled way so that it ends up at T. And then uh, the open gromov witten theory in this T star S3 with n copies on S3 should be equal to the closed gromov witten theory. So kind of gromov witten count in, let's call this X, this manifold, with this identification of parameters. So, uh, I thought the area of CP1 was called Q. I, I think Q is e to the T. Oh, okay. So this is sort of logarithm of Q. Um, right. So now... Uh, is there an easy interpretation of N on the right-hand side? Or do I have to sum this over all N to extract it from the right? I think you have to sum over all N, so it's not... It's not a sum. It's a, a, you can specialize it out. Um, it's, 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 it's yeah, it's true only if n goes to infinity. I think you have to do, yeah. But uh, so now maybe maybe we can recover this k k equals zero in some understandable manner here, because here so here so this so so okay so what can we say so somehow this curve count can be done. So we're supposed to do the count curves here, and then you can do it. To, I don't know, Pandre Panda maybe can do it. And, 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 and this, and I, I'm sorry I don't answer your quiz, but we can also ex express these churn Simons. And they are in fact, I mean, so mathematically it's sort of check that they actually agree, right? So, so although there is no mathematical proof of, of the mechanism, in this case there is a mathematical check of the prediction of this thing. So are you saying, well, oh, so the check is between the two Gromov Witten things? No, no, I mean, the, the, this Gromov Witten I think we cannot quite do, but we can, we can expand, and I, I, I'm sorry exactly as I couldn't answer your question, but there is a way to write that somebody else probably knows well, to write this partition function for S3 in some rather understandable manner. And, and there the answers check out. So what is the k equal to zero? Yeah, that's what I didn't answer, and I still cannot answer, so I'm sorry about that, but I, I will try to, to, to come up with a good answer. Yeah. So that, that, that was what I might suggest, maybe you can 
from here recover what it would be. Because this is a curve count that we're more familiar with, right? What I would like to hear is some kind of completely fuzzy physics explanation of what I'm supposed to do with the space of U1 connections to get this thing. Yes. And I'm not going to give it to you now. <laughs> But I, I can certainly try later. So, okay. So now, so we, we still we want to include knots in this story, and let us include knots. So, Sorry, yeah. quick question. So you're saying that Q is e to the t, right? And well, again, Q okay. is e to the t. Yes. And before we specialize Q to one, we're just yes. setting t to zero. Yes. And that's exactly the code. When the area of this is zero, then you're basically in the cotangent bump. So basically here. So you don't care about these things. So no curves. Okay. So. Uh, So, so there is a way to include knots in this story, and this is due to uh, I said, yeah, this is probably not a Guru Vafa. What I said is Gopa Kumar Vafa, but here it's a Guru Vafa. Uh, so, because I missed the knot. So, so, so in order to include knot, so, so, so what we do is we take this T star S three. And uh, remember, this is S3, so that, that's the n copies of this we have on, on each other. And then we add, we add the co-normal, uh, the co-normal of the knot. And now we want to count holomorphic curves in the same spirit, with several boundary, with, with they can look whatever they want. But there is just one copy of this LK and many copies here. And uh, and, and, and that can be shown on the churn simon side to correspond to some insertion of, the, uh, <coughs> of something in the path integral. And basically, what happens is that you're, you're supposed to take this path integral and you insert 1 minus e to the x, where e to the minus x, actually, which, which, so a, this is s1 times uh, r2 again, and this x basically corresponds indeed to U1 connection, so it's a monodromy around this generator of LK times the holonomy of our connection A along K. So this is a, it's supposed to take determinant and inverse. So this is somehow you, it's the same type of argument as Witten used from beginning, so I'm not going to give it. But what this then comes down to, and, and of course, so now this is why I don't answer your question primarily, because the, the thing that we're interested in now would divide out by all the, I mean, it's expect, expectation value. So, so we're somehow, you know, this I 4K and so on. So uh, here also, I'm a little bit sloppy. But, but anyway, so we're normalizing this by, by the S3 partition function. So, 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 and what comes out, in fact, here is uh, the colored Homfli polynomial. So you expand this as a determinant, and then you get symmetric uh, traces in symmetric representation. So, so after all, this is just the sum of, of the case, the Homfli polynomial, and case symmetric, uh, maybe I put kh, it's not too many k's, e to the kx, or perhaps minus. But anyway, so what is this? This is something fairly possible to calculate. So Homfli polynomial uh, is a knot polynomial when you just use this SU2, which is derived from some, so you can compute it from, for any knot by some relation with coefficient like this. So polynomial for this guy, polynomial for that guy, plus polynomial for that guy is zero, and some coefficient. So it's somehow iteratively computable. And the colored Homfli is not quite computed from that, but you need to take also cables of the knot, but it's fairly, fairly computable thing. So, uh, so now, <coughs> what we see is we, we, we see this, this picture, and what we would like to do is we would like to apply the Gupta Kuma Vafa trick to just to go from the from the three from the cotangent bundle of S three to the to the resolved conifold instead, and we can certainly do it, and. Uh, and believing in the first strange statement, then it is clear. 
as mathematicians, why do we want to do it? We want to do it because uh, this, uh, there's somewhere where it's possible to count curves. So that's what I'm, what I'm aiming for. So this is kind of quite nice manifold, right? You have, it's, it's a compact, it's not a compact manifold, but it has a kind of a compact part and a positive infinity. So, so I, I want to have somewhere to kind of make a little bit sense of such, such things like this curve count. This is not too bad, right? Such counts. Uh, uh, right. You're saying this is better because it doesn't force all the curves to be generated. Yes, yes, that's right. So, uh, that's right. So, so somehow this, this count we understand. I think this count we don't really understand as well. So, but what would happen is somehow exactly the same. So here is our provided that, let's assume for a moment that the co-normal does not intersect S3. In fact, you can always shift it off a little bit. <clears throat> Maybe I'll skip the explanation of that for now. And, and then imagine that we have these curves, somehow these holomorphic curves, which used to look like this, they end on the, on the S3 zero section. So now, the, in the transition, what one should imagine is that all the holes of these curves, they kind of just shrink to, to points, and then, then it's clear that this is in T star S3. And if we believe this is clear what's going to happen in X. So in X, this boundary just stays, and then you get somehow this disk instead, right? So basically, what all this thing, this dictionary is telling us is that this function should be equal to the Gromer-Witten invariance of LK in X divided by all the closed curves in X. So, 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 so the Homfley polynomial encodes the holomorphic curves with boundary on LK sitting in X, okay? Do you get some kind of mark point conditions on the... No, no mark point condition. That's just uh, for illustrational purposes. <laughs> the, boundary sh the boundary did shrink. It's, it's not really mark point. In fact, it's a, in the physics proof, there's a whole disk sitting there somehow. There's a, some, okay. But, but this, this is the picture. So now, um, <clears throat> in order to, to still cut some, to, uh, I'm skipping a little bit of this. Um, maybe I shouldn't. So, yeah, I'm saying two words. So, so, so let's call this function the somehow the wave function of K. And then, uh, one can. We can now try to take out the contributions from kind of small disks, indeed doing more or less what Katrin was asking for. So we're going, going to do sort of GL1, uh, <coughs> GL1, churn Simons on, on this S1 times R2. And when you write down the, the uh, form of the action, you see that what you're doing, so here at, at infinity sits some sort of torus, and the connection has kind of periods p and x, and what you're doing is just, when you write up the path integral, you see that you're just doing quantum mechanics in variables p and x. So, <clears throat> so the action somehow uh, periods p and x. So, so therefore, uh, what you find when you quantize is that you should replace. Okay. Uh, so if, if you do, so you want to do uh, let's say GL1 or U1, GL1, churn simons theory on... Why, why do you want to do that? So, <coughs> I, I said I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to count holomorphic curves. So you're going to play Witten's game in reverse now. You're going to go yeah. back from... Just, just one second. So, so I'm, I'm going to try to count curves from starting on LK and then kind of closing up. But there will be these small curves that just kind of constants in some sense that go from LK to itself. And I want to, in some sense, get rid of them. And then I play Witten's game in reverse because I know by Witten's argument that they would be Chern-Simons theory here. 
And in words, what happens is that the churn simons theory on this guy just looks like, path integral looks like quantum mechanics in variables x and p. And, and then we know what is quantization from some kind of, I don't know, whatever, high school. And, and so, the, <laughs> so, so, so that means that we should replace p by this g as d dx. Right? So p acting, so, and that's a kind of multiplying by these short little strings. P acting on the wave function should be <coughs> G as D dx. So somehow psi k and this also psi k. Okay. And, and then and then also remembering maybe next year or some other year, I don't know. <coughs> so, so, so remember that you can then express The, the wave function, uh, this is called this short wave asymptotics, how you derive, uh, when, when you have this uh, Hamilton-Jacobi theory, how you kind of could guess quantum mechanics, something like that. So, so, <clears throat> so this is uh, somehow this is standard expansion. And then there comes a high, higher order kind of zero, <laughs> gs, gs squared, and so on. But remember what this was, so this was just it's still up there. It was just a count of holomorphic curves. And, and GS was the genus parameter. So this is, this is here, by our other interpretation, supposed to be just the disk potential. So I'm going to call it WK of X. Right? So this is disk potential. Disk count. So we're counting rigid holomorphic disks on lambda. So we forget about all. all all things with some topology in it and just count disks. And so this thing is predicting that we would have P is dwk dx. And in fact, looking at the Homfley <coughs> is somehow dequantizing the Homfley polynomial or, or its, its recursion relation. What you, what you find is that this, this thing should, so I'm, I'm really, saying very briefly what, what, what uh, happens. But anyway, should give a local parameterization of an algebraic curve. And in other words, so, what, what, so, so if that's given by a polynomial, I will write that polynomial. Maybe there are many a's, but maybe I'll anyway write a of k e to the x, e to the p, and I'm keeping this q, and I think of it as just as a variable. So th this is somehow the thing given by this. And so, and basically you can compute this a from, from the Homfley, colored Homfley, or a piece of it. And then what was observed, and that's the starting point of this talk really, and it's joint work by, by Myself and Lenny Ng and, and Aganagik and Waffa. So, so what was observed was that this AK uh, is equal to the augmentation polynomial uh, in all examples. So, so I'm going to try to explain now why that is the case. So, so this somehow. Uh, my next goal. So, so, so now we can, in some sense, forget about uh, all of this physics background. But, but still, so what we are going to try to relate is now we're going to try to relate augmentations with Q not equal one. So, more global things uh, with curve counts in X. So let me just kind of. Re redraw this picture. It's not U1, U0. If what it's not U1, then you have the grand ones in the middle, which is not given just one equation. Uh, right, if you have many components, yeah. yeah. So then you have a Lagrangian uh, given by actually many equations. It's still Lagrangian in, in, the, in, the, in the space, and, 
uh, basically, the, this part of the story is more or less the same. Uh, it, it will again give various branches of this augmentation uh, variety, but again, the, the kind of the, the, the disk count uh, that it's it's a little bit right. Um, so 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 basically, if if you have many component link, you can also have other connected fillings of those components, right? So, so you cannot just look at the co-normals, but there have to be other Lagrangians which allow you to, to map mixed chords, so chords going from one to another down to, to something non-trivial as well. But basically, all, all these, they give a variety which should be the characteristic variety of the D module of the home again. So uh, may, maybe I'll, I'll reach that to, to the rest. But, but indeed, the, in, in, when you have many components, it's a higher dimensional variety that replaces this guy. So you have... Uh, One question, so yes. if you quantize it, uh, it kills you, yeah. I mean, if you quantize... If I quantize the AK... Uh -huh. It kills the partition function. It kills the partition exactly, yes, 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 yes. And then, and that's if I kind of... If I'm fast enough to get there, I, I would want to explain what that, that looks like from the point of view of contact homology. So it's a more complete, it's like an SFT version of this contact homology. You should know this quantization of this guy. Okay, um, so, um, so le let, me, let me look at what we have. So we have this X, and inside this X sits LK. And I didn't explain how to shift it off the zero section, but it's, I, I'm, I'm just gonna now say that it happened. So, so, and, 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 and we have, so this maybe is LK, and inside here we have a count of disks, uh, which I will call W sub K of X. Uh, that's a count of disks, um, counts holomorphic disks. And again, we're in this Calabi out setting, so they're all rigid. Uh, with boundary on 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 uh, L K, and now the thing that we're setting out to prove. Uh, so I, I would say theorem in quotes, but maybe I'm still saying theorem. Uh, so this is this is so okay. One can question how much of this is really proved in terms of perturbation theory and so on, but I'm, I'm not going to enter that discussion, so I'm calling it theorem anyway. So uh, the, the theorem is that if you take this P is equal to the W dx, uh, uh, is a branch of the augmentation variety. Okay. Just to understand what this is saying. So PWDX is a polynomial in X. Yeah, right. So maybe I should write it. Uh, it's a kind of polynomial in E to the X or, or power series. So it's some count count of curves in that wraps k times around X. So this is an equation of the variables X and P, and you're saying that uh, is a branch of it. That's a branch. That's lo locally a, a branch of the augmentation variety. Is WK of X a thing that's defined in mathematics today? I would say so, yeah. I mean, maybe somebody else would contest it. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. I mean, this, uh, I, 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 I will hint at how it would be defined, at least. <laughs> okay. maybe, but it's a borderline defined. Okay. <laughs> but but not, yes. What, what about it makes it not defined? So you're supposed to count. Uh, is open gromov witten invariant. Uh, so, so it's a, some kind of framing contribution that's maybe not kind of completely sort. The, definitely, you need all this kind of abstract perturbation machinery. So, so I, uh, okay, I, I don't know. Maybe is it defined? <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. But note that what is defined, so defined or not, the augmentation variety is kind of very rigorously defined. So it's somehow transporting some things to infinity where you can actually deal with them perhaps easier. Okay. There is no Q in this? There is Q. Q uh, is here, sorry, yes. 
So, so we are keeping track of the full, of the, so this, this, this has a homology class, it wraps around here on the boundary, but also there is the, the CP1, the S2 inside, right? That's also carries homology. So I'm, I'm sorry, there's a Q here. Yes. I have a philosophical question. So like, mm -hmm. if you on a boundary, uh, augmentations I thought were about like, fillings in the simplification. And here you're filling inside um, so, somewhere, else. In, somewhere else. Why is that okay? I'm going to explain that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So that's the kind of the case. So, so now uh, let's, let's first try, so how would we go about proving something like this? Well, we would just try head on with our old scheme. We, we tried to count holomorphic curves like these to define, to define the augmentation. So kind of rigid things, d is equal zero like that. And then we try to prove the chain map equations. We have to look at one dimensional moduli space. But now there's a kind of huge difference between this, the previous thing, and that's that what can happen is that some kind of boundary bubble starts forming and, and then splits off. This is somehow the relative version of what, what, what Helmut. Just these pictures live in what space? So this, whole, this, this boundary lives in LK, and the whole disk lives in X. And now I have a, it's a one dimensional moduli space, so, so somehow I'm following. This, this is also in X with boundary on LK. This is in X with boundary on LK. So what I'm trying to explain is that there could be one parameter family that splits into a rigid disk from a, <coughs> sorry, a, a, a one-dimensional disk from above and a rigid disk formed on L just, right? So this is somehow the obstruction. To the, so so that, that would say that our previous nice thing that said that this chain map phi composed with D is zero, that's not true anymore. So it's, we kind of, this, this is the, the bad, yes. It's not exact anymore. LK is not exact, right? That's exactly, and that's a, even the manifold not quite exact. But, but, but in particular, there could be such disks and they obstruct. And this here, unlike in Helmut's lectures, this is co-dimension one phenomena, so it really matters. But now, we somehow learn from Fukaya how to overcome this thing. So that's what the, the Mohammed's talking about. So you, you have to find these bounding co-chains. And here, uh, of course, there is no bounding co-chain because what one would like to do, so here everything is rigid, so you don't, it's not so much higher moduli spaces you have to care about. But what, what, what is the scheme is that you would take this disk, uh, you take this disk, and you try to find, so, so here is your disk, and you try to find a chain bound, bound that, that its boundary bounds inside S1 times R3. But of course you cannot, because S1, S1 uh, has some homology. But you can do uh, almost the same thing. You can pull out its homology to infinity. So we, instead of finding bounding co-chains, we find sort of, I don't know what to call them, but they, we take for each such disk, uh, so for each rigid disk D, now sitting inside X with boundary on LK, uh, we take a chain which at infinity looks like some, uh, so, so this is a chain in, inside LK, right? So the boundary is an S1, it's a circle sitting inside LK, and we take a, a, a bounding co-chain, or a bounding, bounding chain, I don't know whatever I say, co-chain, bounding chain, which begins on this guy and ends on k times x, some kind of, at infinity we have this nice longitude thing and, and at infinity this, this uh, cycle just looks like x and then straight down. So multiple, whatever multiple is, uh, is required by this. What is x? x? x is the longitude variable, so maybe I should call it xi or something, it's a specific way. And now, uh, how does this cure this problem? Well, it cures it in the way that when, when, you, when you, you, you can now somehow pass this thing by counting instead disks like this with insertions of, of, the, bounding co of the bounding chains. So, so, so when, when you hit this thing, so here's your moduli space, you go into the boundary splitting and then you have this bounding co-chain and you continue the, 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 you continue the family like this. So this is somehow this uh, whole idea of 
No, maybe not hold, but this is, uh, this is Fukaya and company's idea, right? And so in this way, you can now uh, avoid this interior splitting by at the cost of upgrading your disks to counting, not just these disks, D equals zero disks, but, but you need to count rather these, these, so it's hard to draw this beautiful picture. So I'm just drawing a schematically a line instead. Uh, so by counting disks with insertions of all these things, right? So now, what would the compactness theorem be? So we, we took out the bad part of the boundary. Well, the compactness theorem now would be that we, we, we have no interior splitting, so we have splittings only of the following sort. So this is one and this is zero, zero, zero. But of course we need to keep track of all the insertions. And there is no guarantee that our insertions live only in the compact part. They could certainly travel out to infinity. But at infinity they're very easily counted. So if I have one of these disks, which now is a disk in the differential, uh, out at infinity my Chains just looks exactly like this, right? So if I want to see how many times does this disk, how many insertions can I do, I just have to keep track of how many times does it intersect this standard curve, right? And if you think about it, so at infinity, the, the chains that come from these guys, it really looks now like, it really sort of looks like this, whatever it was, CKL e to the KX QL, right? It's just copies of this thing, one for each disk, so you have this. So, so in other words, counting these insertions is the same thing, because if I wrap k times around, I can, in, I go once here p, I can insert it k times. So, so it's exactly setting p is equal to dw k dx. Right? So if I want to count, if I, let's say I have just one curve here, it looks like e to the k x. And now I want, and I have another curve up here, which goes, if I, after I close it up, goes along this, this uh, circle. So how many, how many curves should I count? Well, I can insert this guy. I can choose one of the k points, right? But I have k choices, right? So my count should be k times e to the kx. And therefore, you know, I have a couple of coefficients and so on, but the mechanism is exactly the same. So if I put P equal to the W the KX, then this upper guy in the differential counts curves with these insertions. And the fact that now this, this matches, there's a proof of this uh, theorem. Right? Because from this, this picture, the proof is clear. Right? If I draw it with the insertions, then indeed the, the chain map equation holds. And, uh, and ex, ex, you know, making this substitution is exactly uh, what we should do. So what did we gain in the end? So this, we said two, two different kinds of counts of holomorphic disks match with each other somehow. Well, for example, in the one and only example that we know, you can now count, if you know this kind of Lagrange, you know, down note, you can now count count curves on it, right? So, so we know somehow that this this is the polynomial. Now you can solve solve for p in terms of x and then integrate once and you find the disk potential for this Lagrangian inside x, right? So, so, you, so by knowing the augmentation polynomial which you can compute uh, by elimination theory, so for the trefoil it's a more complicated thing, you can now count holomorphic disks uh, with boundary on this Lagrangian inside the uh, X. How is Q vector in this type of With The Q? Capital Q? Yeah, so it doesn't play a role. I mean, it just uh, keeps track on how many times it wraps around the the central CP1. So it doesn't, it doesn't interfere with the boundary here, right? So it's just carried along. It's like, a, so, so, so this W, this was W, right? 
And then dw, the thing that you want, that's just q is just it's just k c k l, e k x q l. So it's just carried along. So from anything which you've said, it could be that the branch of the augmentation variety you get is always the stupid branch of the augmentation variety, like it's a straight line. No, it's not. It's not. So why is it not? Uh, I don't know. But <laughs> no, but in the examples it is not. It's not, uh, but, but, but in particular, they, right. They in Congress, if you want, want to actually know the disk potential, you have to know after which branch you're supposed to take. Yes, but so here you kind of, so, so this, this would be like calculating near p is equal zero, right? Then you know that you're supposed to take this. But there are many questions here. So in particular, in order to recover the whole, when it's irreducible, you're fine, right? If it, and that sometimes happens, but not always. When it's not, you somehow would like to find more Lagrangians, right? To, to, to cover all of it in some sense. And I don't know how to do that. Um, so I realize I have no more time. But let me just maybe kind of say uh, four words and leave this to, for discussion. So, uh, so indeed, as <coughs> Jan was saying, so there is there's supposed to be a lift of this thing. So, so the that upgrades, so we have this augmentation polynomial that upgrades this to an operator equation with the same symbols, but where, where indeed this p, p now is equal to gs ddx in, in line with the, what I drew for the wave function. And, and this, what, what happens here, this thing should kill the this, this should be generator of the ideal corresponding to this Schrodinger equation, uh, or, the, or whatever it's called, d-module ideal. And then uh, what, what we are working on, and it's very much work in progress, is to actually see how to use SFT. So to do counterpart of this contact homology, but instead use, in some sense, all curves uh, up here, and count them and, and recover this, this relation. So, so that's, uh, and, and we managed somehow, it's an interesting story, I think it's far from finished, but I, it's looking good so we could, well, I'm not somehow trivial, but we managed to do for Hopflink and for Trefoil not. So it, it looks kind of interesting and it certainly is, has a lot of challenging holomorphic curve problems, among them, um, uh, what's uh, this, uh, or obstruction bundle gluing, and also I would say some new phenomena where, where, you, uh, where you cross kind of multiple times and so on. So, so maybe, but, but uh, I think I'd better leave this to, to discussion and stop at this. Okay. Any questions? Um, I think that, so, the count of the object in the middle, where I think it's sort of like a hybrid of uh, augmentation and uh, bounding code chain, which essentially make this unobstructed count and also linearize the count of the Yes, it's, that's right. That's exactly right. And you can, of course, this, uh, this trick uh, applies, uh, of course, fairly generally. I mean, now here is a very good case when all the curves are rigid, but if you want to go into applying this, you, you could. Uh, you see that when, when the homology, when you have uh, these Lagrangians with some infinity, and the homology of the Lagrangian generated from infinity, then you can always pull out cycles like this. They're kind of as good as bounding code chains, and then you get similar type equations if in the non-exact case. Right? So, but but, the, but the, the cycles that sit inside purely and, and bound holomorphic curve, they are behaving exactly like in this standard compact Lagrangian floor homology story. But some of them you can get rid of by, by transporting to infinity. And, and what this, the, the, the lesson maybe is that this is a, it's actually kind of quite efficient way of computing. Uh, so, so I would say that compared to what's, so this uh, augmentation polynomial, maybe this, this one is a little bit difficult, but this guy is just, a, as I said, it's just counted by, 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 by elimination theory from not something very concrete. So, so, so this calculation is comparatively very simple, whereas this uh, other computing directly inside is a kind of difficult task, I would say. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so you mentioned the the what do you call it? Framing uh, ambiguity at infinity. How does that yeah. enter into the? I'll tell you. So. Uh, yeah, so, so of course I'm drawing pictures sufficiently fast that I'm kind of doing the opposite to helmet. Okay. So <laughs> it's doing so slow you can find a mistake, but if you draw really fast, <laughs> no. so so you see, what, so the question is really what is this uh, going with the potential? So remember what we suppose. So, so we start from something and we realize we have to count. So it splits like that. So we would have to count. You know, ins insertions of this bounding code chain for this guy here, right? But now, uh, of course, th there could be some splitting which somehow splits. You, you cannot say when things split, right? So, so when you think about this, it could be that some of the insertions of some other guy actually ends up here, right? So, so the, the, the count of the, the disk potential, which I'm saying just count disks, does not quite just count disks if it's supposed to work with this formula, because it will have to count disks with this bounding code chain. So, so if I have one disk, and then I have already kind of some lower energy disks, I have to count that disk, so all, all possible trees of insertions of other disks in some sense, right? So, so actually, the, the this gamma witten count is uh, depends on the, somehow the choice of these binding code chains, and that's a little bit like, you know, if you frame the boundaries in some different way, you would get some different count, right? So that's a kind of some kind of bounding framing ambiguity, I would say, or or you can maybe borrow the framing from a framing on on the on the solid torus, something like that. But, but admittedly, I, I, I mean, this is easy to see. I didn't work out kind of the details in any, any sense. But in, indeed, this is... I mean, the level of formulae, can you say how to compute the different... I mean, like physicists have predicted sort of what the dependency on the framing should be. Yeah, there, there are a couple of different framing. So, so one, one framing that they talk about is somehow just a choice of basis x compared to p. And, and, and basically, this, this guy should know everything. You can make a change of variables and compute things. But realizing it, again, is somehow that the preferred. So here, somehow, my feeling here kills the p variable. If you do something in some other frame, you preferably would like to kill the variable that you solve for in this potential formula. And a priori, we don't, I don't know how to get all the suitable Lagrangians for that. But basically, this polynomial should know everything. That, that's, that's, that, that's, that's, I think. But then, to create the geometric setting for which it knows everything, it's not so easy. Mm -hmm. How are you uh, buying yourself non commutativity from different higher genus curves? Yeah, so. Um, maybe, uh, maybe in discussion, it's not. It's, it's exactly. So, it's, it, so by doing this, but thinking about all the kind of higher genus curves that you could build by insertion as well. So see, if, if you, for example, if you have this, this disk and you want to insert this guy, so this builds you a disk. But now when you do higher genus, you, you have two connections, two insertions, you can choose both and so on. And you find that the count is just exactly what you get by taking this guy, acting on this guy. So, but uh, uh, maybe I can explain in discussion. So this is a kind of a curve count derivation of this. All right, so I yeah.